Commerce, Consumer and Monetary Affairs holds a hearing on its year-long investigation of the Internal Revenue Service. Members examine allegations of employee integrity problems and the inability of the IRS Inspection Office to monitor and discipline employees. Chairman Douglas Barnard of Georgia and his colleagues hear from the General Accounting Office Directors of Tax Policy and Administrative Issues and from the former and present Commissioner of the IRS. Today, the Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee continues its hearings into IRS employee integrity issues and the service's ability to detect, investigate, and discipline misconduct by senior management. Although we have not set dates for additional hearings, the hearing record to date and the sentiment of the members suggest the need for further hearings. On Tuesday, we heard reports from subcommittee investigators on eight specific incidents of misconduct by high-level employees of the IRS and the service's response. Our investigators concluded that there have been serious employee integrity problems within the IRS, that there have been a serious, a serious failure on the part of the IRS national office to effectively manage employee integrity programs, that misconduct by senior level managers is too often ignored entirely or ineptly investigated, resulting in a clearance for the wrongdoers and that pervasive fear exists in IRS employees at all levels that reporting the misconduct of their superiors or cooperating in an investigation of those superiors will result in retaliation against them. Yesterday, we heard testimony from present and former IRS senior level employees of the Internal Revenue Service, some of whom had direct knowledge of the wrongdoing cases investigated by the subcommittee. The others had knowledge of senior level misconduct in other parts of the country without adequate IRS follow-up. I want to re reiterate the same two points that I have made yesterday in my statement on the opening of these hearings. The first is our belief that the overwhelming majority of all IRS employees are hardworking, conscientious, and honest. The second is that our expectation that these hearings will be a positive force within the IRS for reform of employee integrity, policies, practice, procedures, and organizational structure. This subcommittee intends to maintain a continuing interest in IRS employee integrity problems and, more importantly, in the service's response to those problems. Our first witness this morning will be representatives of the General Accounting Office, who will testify on the adequacy of IRS Internal Security Management Information System, called ISMIS. We will then have testimony about an incident involving IRS testimony before the House Judiciary Committee. This incident, which IRS officially disputes, raises some of the same serious issues that we have expressed in these hearings about the service's willingness to be candid with Congress when sensitive issues are involved. We will devote the balance of the day to the present and former IRS commissioners. It is my assumption that the IRS will attempt to provide specific and complete answers to the subcommittee members' questions. In order to assure ourselves that IRS could provide the information that we need to conduct our investigation, I requested the American Law Division of the Library of Congress to provide us with an opinion on whether the Privacy Act or the Freedom of Information Act would prevent the IRS from discussing the conduct cases of present and former employees. The answer is emphatically no. I also asked the American Law Division whether Internal Revenue Code 6103 would prevent the IRS from answering subcommittee questions on cases for which the subcommittee had taxpayer disclosure authorizations from the subjects of those cases. Again, the answer is emphatically no. A copy of the American, a copy of the American Law Division opinion has been made available to the IRS and is included in the folders of our members. Before we hear from our witnesses, I want to include in the hearing record today a statement from the former Inspector General of the Department of Treasury, Michael Hill, regarding the need for structural reforms in the way IRS inspection divisions function. We asked Mr. Hill, who was the Treasury IG until a few weeks ago? 
to offer his recommendations to our subcommittee on how IRS inspection responsibilities could be made more effective. We asked him, would the transfer to the IG of the responsibilities and resources of IRS internal audit and internal security divisions materially assist in assuring that employee integrity cases and issues are effectively addressed? Mr. Hill responded, yes. Yes, I am convinced that consolidating the IRS internal audit and internal security divisions into the Office of the Inspector General would not only tend to ensure increased integrity, but would save the taxpayers money by eliminating duplication of services, enhancing economies of scale, and providing for more efficient management. We value very much Mr. Hill's views because of his knowledge of IRS employee integrity issues and the operation of its inspection division. I might say in the record will be a copy of the questions that we uh, ask of Mr. Hill. Mr. Martinez, do you have an opening statement? No, I don't, Mr. Chairman. I'm just anxious to hear from the witnesses. This morning, our first panel will consist of Ms. Jenny Stathis, a Director of Tax Policy and Administrative Issues, General Government Division, U.S. Accounting Office. And she's accompanied by Mr. Mark J. Gillen, Evaluator, and Mr. Thomas D. Short, Evaluator. As been a, our custom in this hearing, I want to ask you if you would stand and take this oath. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that this answer is in the affirmative. <laughs> Ms. Dathis, we will uh, hear from you first, and without objection, your entire testimony will be included in the record and you can summarize as you so see fit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are pleased to be here this morning, and I will proceed to summarize uh, my statement. You have introduced my colleagues on either side of me who were responsible for the work we are discussing this morning. We are here to talk about the Internal Security Management Information System, and that is a database which IRS uses to help make workload and operational decisions about its investigations of alleged misconduct by employees. You also ask for our views on a new information system, uh, which is under development. Last year, Mr. Chairman, to uh, set the stage for, um, for our conclusions, uh, the subcommittee obtained data from IRS, from its ISMIS, uh, the internal security system, and you provided us that information and asked us to analyze it for you. Uh, with that data, you hope to obtain a perspective as to the type of employees, the type of violations that were being investigated, and what the outcomes of those investigations might be. Uh, we proceeded with that analysis, uh, but uh, as we began looking at the data, we decided that there were too many uh, problems with it to provide you that perspective. There were inconsistencies in the data, uh, there were missing components of the data uh, that led us to conclude uh, that it would be misleading for us to provide you uh, a perspective with that data. Uh, for example, of what IRS calls special inquiry investigations, we could not decide where 40 percent of them took place. Of the types of cases that are called conduct cases, uh, we did not feel comfortable describing the basic characteristics such as the type of violation or the grade of the employee in 17 percent of the cases. Uh, similarly, what action IRS took, whether the employee was cleared, suspended, or removed, uh, in 29 percent of the cases we were not comfortable with the data. Uh, whether or not IRS referred them for criminal prosecution, in 57 percent of the cases we were not comfortable with the data. Uh, and any result of a criminal prosecution. Uh, was data that was furnished just by the investigators or was this data furnished by IRS? This is data that IRS provided the subcommittee from its internal security management system. Uh, the, the data that goes into the system is to come originally from the investigators in the field who are doing the investigation. That is IRS investigators. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. 
uh, because of validity problems with that system, IRS has been developing a new system that will have additional validity checks so that incomplete or illogical data uh, will not be accepted. It is a little early to tell you how effective that system will be because it's still under development. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, and I won't, I'll, I'll tend not to from this point on, but I'm concerned about this. What you're saying is that the information that they have furnished you about the present system uh, it, uh, it has been such that you could not make an evaluation. That's correct. The reason I'm asking you to repeat that for emphasis is I'm sure that that testimony developing today will probably try to uh, try to uh, uh, emphasize that we have not probably been dealing at, that is our investigators with solid material but I'm somewhat interested in that you cannot get uh, solid material from the IRS about their present system. I just want to be sure that I understand what you're saying. Well, the information could be correct. We, uh, we have no way of knowing whether it is or not. Um, recall that um, for this particular assignment for the subcommittee, we did not have access to taxpayer data either. So we had no way of checking the data against any sort of records. Uh, we were merely working with the data that we were provided, which mask the identity of people. And what we're saying is that we found cases where a, um, a particular investigation would show, for example, uh, that an employee had been cleared administratively of the charge against him, uh, but the same data file would show he'd been found guilty in a criminal prosecution. Um, those two things can't possibly be correct. Uh, therefore, you know that there are enough inconsistencies in the data uh, to be concerned about its validity. Thank you very much. Could I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you know, I think most of our congressional officers have uh, computers and input data to cover the caseload that's been on that's ongoing in the district office and. It's connected with our computer here so that this office can check and we can check back and forth what the status is. And I find that uh, it's the validity of the person putting the data in, not the computer system itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know really uh, is refining any system that you've got to refine the people before you, the system is going to be refined at all in any way. Because if you want to put in conflicting reports like that, it's where they're entered, at what terminal they're entered, mm -hmm. as to how they're going to appear to at what terminal they're drawn out from. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be some better way of, of check and balance to make sure that only right information is put in there, and that always depends on the individual. Don't you I'd like to um, comment on that? It uh, can depend uh, in several different ways, on several different things. The new system that IRS is developing uh, has the potential to be more reliable because they are building into it uh, controls uh, that hopefully will not allow uh, an investigator to put in inconsistent information. In the case that I described as an example, um, they are going to try to put in a control so that if you showed someone having been cleared administratively, the system would not accept a code that then indicated he had been found guilty in a criminal prosecution. You know, those would be two inconsistent pieces of information and the system would reject the second entry when it, uh, when it showed that it was inconsistent. But would that prohibit a person from not entering at all, number one, and number two, um, if you know the code that blocks it, can't you change the code? Can't you get, uh, access the code and, and change it then? change the information in the computer? Sure. Uh, they, so it really they, then relies yeah. on the integrity of the individual putting the, uh, that, that, the that's information correct. into the computer. That's correct. And it, uh, and it will depend upon what supervisory reviews they put into the system. Uh, whether, in fact, an individual investigator can go back later and correct a code or whether that will require a supervisor to approve that particular change. I mean, those are all things that they can design to put into the system. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that I don't care what kind of a system you develop, you're not going to be able in pro to program in any way honesty and integrity. No way. It's going to depend on the individuals and we've got to change the procedure of monitoring the individuals and not via computer but via by actual hands-on mm -hmm. management effort. Okay. 
Please continue, Ms. Lane. The, uh, I'm just about through, uh, and in fact, Mr. Martinez's questions brought out one of the points I was going to make, and, and that is the type of control that they're trying to put into the new system. Uh, we also uh, hope that it will be more timely because the system will provide for regional staffs to input their data directly into the system. IRS does have a few um, uh, decisions to make, and uh, as it moves to implement the system, um, one question is how much of the old data will be verified and corrected before it's input into the new system. Um, another question is at what point IRS considers the case is closed, whether, uh, whether sometimes they're being closed prematurely so that you don't get all of the actions that have been taken. And they are developing the system under fairly tight time frames. And our hope is that they will take the time to develop good user manuals to provide the right training for the people in the field so that they will know how to uh, operate the system properly. And that will have a, uh, an effect on the validity of that data and its usefulness in the future uh, for subcommittees such as yours trying to get a perspective of the data. Uh, with that, I will complete my summary and uh, we will be pleased to answer questions. Ms. Stathis, how did the IRS react to the report that you sent to our committee on ISMAS? Well, IRS uh, sent us a letter, and I, I think that they agree that there are problems with the current system, but I think they have a disagreement as to the severity of the problem. And uh, they offered several explanations as to why uh, the data could have been the way we found it. Um, but in offering several different um, explanations as to why we would find a missing element or a zero element in various fields, they in fact corroborated that the data could mean several different things. Uh, which uh, just led us to believe that, it, um, that our position was well-founded, that, that the data could be misleading. Did you consider, that they are, did you consider their criticisms uh, valid? And were you able to respond and justify your conclusions to the IRS? Uh, I did send a letter back to IRS um, explaining uh, what I thought about their uh, positions and our concerns with it, and, uh, and we will... And we're very happy to share that with the subcommittee if you'd be, like to have it. Well, we'd like to have that, have it as part of the record. Mr. Stathis, can you explain how you coordinated your work with the IRS on the ISMAS system, administratively or operationally, and did the IRS handle your request in any unusual or uncustomary manner? Well, I think that, um, I guess there are two parts to my answer. Um, the initial work that we did for the subcommittee last year is sort of part one, and then this year we did more work looking at the development of the new system, and, and that's part two. In uh, part one, uh, our relationship with IRS was somewhat more formal than it normally is in a GAO audit, in that our requests for information had to be in writing. And I think on that part of it, the uh, request for information had to come from the subcommittee, not from us. And um, when we had meetings on questions, attorneys were present. Um, our responses, information from IRS then came in writing back to the subcommittee before we received it. So we had a fairly circuitous route to get information on, on the first part of our work. Uh, when we did the work this spring in looking at the uh, design of the new system, uh, both we and IRS uh, recognized that the uh, uh, process we had last year was not that satisfactory. Did and so we had a, the taxpayers did the uh, uh, did information about taxpayers have have any bearing at all on this? I mean, was it did tax, taxpayers information have any relevancy to what you were doing? You're asking about 6103 provisions. Yeah. Um, it could have been a concern to the IRS, but the data that we had uh, did not allow us to identify taxpayers. It was camouflaged information. Well, why were, the, why were the attorneys present? Why were IRS attorneys present? I think because of IRS's concerns about 6103. Has this been, has this been was this unusual as far as your previous in, uh, oversight of? Uh... It's very unusual. The stats is, can the IRS provide the subcommittee, in your opinion, with reliable information on the effectiveness of its employee integrity efforts based on the current ISMA system? 
if, if I understand your question correctly, um, that gets to the heart of our conclusion, which is that uh, we didn't feel that we would be doing the subcommittee a, a good service by showing you the information and having it, um, having it reflect the outcome of these cases. So you cannot answer that question, yes. Um, I think that's correct. And you cannot answer it, no. That's correct. Mr. Martinez? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, following up on the fact that uh, uh, we're, somebody is going to, not me, depend on some kind of a system to clear up the mess in the IRS as far as reporting uh, cases of misconduct conduct and following up on them. Uh, in your statement, you, uh, in your written statement, uh, you give an example of 41 uh, conduct cases that uh, you found zero in the data field on referral for criminal prosecution. Uh, using the IRS assumption, you would have concluded that no criminal referral was made to the U.S. Attorney or State Prosecutor. In 41 cases, and probably there are many more than that, and that's because somebody didn't put the information in there because they didn't want any follow-up on it. Uh, do you think that a new data system is really going to change that at all? One of the things about the current system that I think causes it to be more error-prone is that it's our understanding that the regional offices have no confidence in it and are not using it. When you have users in the field who are responsible for inputting the data, but they don't use the system, there is no incentive for them to, to use it, you know, to put the correct information in it. Um, I, I think the goal or the hope with the new system is that it will be useful to regional people and therefore they will have more incentive to use, to put the correct information in it. Uh, let me, uh, because I'm having a hard time understanding how that's really going to correct the problems that exist there. Um, because although we keep referring that they're unique mm -hmm. here, unique there, unique everywhere, they're everywhere. So how, do they, how are they unique? Uh, the system has become corrupt because of arrogance, because uh, of an attitude, no one can touch us. You know, we, and let me give you an example. In your investigation, didn't, didn't you feel that even in the acquiring of broad information, the IRS really hides behind 6103? I don't think that I know the answer to that question. Right. But then back to the other. I would look for a system that would allow people who are reporting wrongdoing to somehow plug into a computer that didn't, uh, couldn't appear to any regional director but had to appear to a national agency, whether it's the Treasury Department or any uh, national investigation author investigating authority. Uh, because you still have, if it's readable by anybody in the regional mm -hmm. office and you're complaining or filing a complaint mm -hmm. of a, of a uh, top level management in the region, that person reporting is still going to be under that uh, threat of harassment as we've, we've seen in so many cases that have been testified to so far. Now, how do we do mm -hmm. that with the system that you're talking about, that they're talking about? I guess um, I have a, um, a different view of of what an investigator might like to do in one of these cases, uh, which is slightly different from yours. And that's as we've looked at different IRS programs, um, uh, such as uh, the Special Enforcement Program where criminal investigators are involved, um, there is, uh, the investigators like to show that there was a lot of action on their case. Uh, and there is, uh, that they would, uh, be considered more successful if they had gotten a prosecution. So it, my own um, premise is that they would be more likely to try to show that uh, than, uh, than, and I think you are, you are wondering whether in fact the incentive would be to go the other way. I, I think you come from a perspective which is reasonable to come from that, you know, uh, someone doing a job in a professional way uh, uh, does that job, one, because he's got pride in himself or herself of doing that job mm -hmm. well. Uh, and, but we also realize that we all have egos, however big or slight, and that a part of that is we get glory, we get rating, and then we get pay. And if that's the motivation, that's fine, and that's what should motivate. But the problem is, is that in so many instances that we've seen already, and that may have been the expectation from the person when he did what was right, and report it, but just the opposite happened. He didn't get the glory, 
He got shunted by his colleagues as a fink, and then he, did, he got less rating, and then he got less pay. And not until many review boards and a lot of protestation and everything else, he finally then, they finally were restored. But in the interim, who's going to restore what was lost over that interim period, you see? And so what I'm saying is that it's fine to have and develop a good system for being able to access information and bring information back up. And that's all the only ability the computer really has. Because it's the old saying that when we first started the use of computers, junk in, junk out. And if we don't have reliable people being able to put that information in and being read by somebody that's responsible, I'm afraid that system isn't going to work now. Maybe you have a different view of that, uh, if you would express it to me. Well, I, I think as I said in the statement, it's really too, I can't assure you that the system is going to be more effective um, until we see it in operation. Uh, that's, that's Mr. Cox. Chairman, your study, as I understand it, uh, is how this covered a three-year period? I believe that's correct. It was 1984 data through 1987. Was that January 1, 84 through December 31st, 87? Yeah. It was um, starting at the beginning of fiscal year 84 through the, uh, the last case was December of 87. It looks as if uh, in excess of 1,200 special inquiries were reported in the MIS system during that period and in excess of 2,600 conduct cases reported. And I'm wondering whether 400 per year is about normal for special inquiry cases and whether 900 per year is about normal for conduct cases. I have no idea. Uh, it is in the three-year period that you looked at, was it steady or was there uh, wide variation? We didn't break out. Once we got into the data and decided that it wasn't useful for uh, providing the broad perspective you all had requested, we didn't break it out by those, do the various permutations by years. Okay. I, I think that uh, Mr. Martinez hit on a very key point, and I think we all recognize it's the oldest maxim in MIS. Garbage in, garbage out. Uh, one important question is, were the 400 per year average cases representative of the number of cases in a well-functioning system that would have been reported? Mm -hmm. uh, or what's the, is this the tip of the iceberg and is the vast majority of uh, special inquiries not being reported? Mm -hmm. Now, another point cases. is that uh, the data were represented to us by IRS as being closed cases. Uh, so we do not know how many additional cases might have been started and worked on but not closed during those years. So you just don't have any idea whether this is, in fact, the tip of the iceberg or whether That's correct. Uh, this represents the universe of cases. I did hear you say, however, that you think that people are not using the system. That's correct. And, and that would lead me to conclude that there are cases that have been either in the preliminary stages referred for action that are not going into the system uh, or that have been uh, actually commenced but for whatever reason aren't reported. The only thing that we know about that is that um, an investigator in the field has to have some type of a code to use to charge his time in order to be paid. Um, so there is some incentive for him to open the case in, in order to, um, to record his time. I wonder if you could help me and perhaps others on the subcommittee understand a little bit about how the current internal security MIS system works uh, by first explaining the difference, for the record, between a special inquiry and a conduct case. Uh, a special inquiry case is one in which uh, the investigator does not feel he has sufficient information to really open a case. Uh, maybe he doesn't necessarily trust the information that he got. He needs a little bit more in order to conclude that it really is an allegation worth pursuing. Uh, once he makes that conclusion, he uh, opens what he calls a conduct case. Uh, following up on that, it would then, I think, be a useful statistic, would it not? for us to know how many special inquiries turned into conduct cases? That's correct. Do we know that number? 
the again the numbers in the system were not um, were not reliable enough for us to report. I mean, the system would suggest that very few, and we are told by internal security that that in fact is not the case. That quite a few are converted, and so there is a disconnect between what managers believe to be the case and what the data show. Let me take you outside the parameters of both the existing internal security MIS system and the one that IRS is working on mm -hmm. to replace it and ask you if you were designing a system from scratch, uh, what would you want it to report to you? Um, that, is, uh, that is a good question. I, I don't know that it's one that we've really given a whole lot of thought to. You know, maybe we could uh, provide you something on that for the record. I, I know that um, there are some regional offices that are collecting information that they feel uh, crucial to their operations that is not part of the national system. So there may be some other data elements um, that you might want. Uh, but I think in terms of the outcome of the cases, um, they are uh, proposing to collect the right kind of information. Yes, I, well, I certainly infer from your testimony mm -hmm. that you would like to see the results of criminal prosecution sure. included. Sure. Uh, and presently they are not. At least uh, for 83 percent of the cases, mm -hmm. they were not. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that the testimony that that we've received suggests that a system functioning properly uh, would encourage input into an MIS system of the category that we're calling special inquiries. Uh, that's the area in which. Intimidation and threats and so on, bribery, coercion, or, or what have you, uh, would be most effective in stopping something ever from happening in the first place. Uh, and if we can monitor a system that tells us that there was a little blip on the screen here, uh, find out whether anything ever became of it, uh, we might know uh, whether or not uh, system wide there were a problem, whether we were managing the problem uh, or not. Mm -hmm. My view is that that is something that uh, a properly designed MIS system for internal security ought to include and encourage. Mm -hmm. uh, would you disagree with that? No, I would not. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, Ms. Dennis, Ms. Stances, thank you very much for the, uh, well, I, I can't say thank you because we didn't get nothing, but, but I mean, we do appreciate the efforts of the GAO in trying to develop something. and. Uh, and, uh, but, but we appreciate the report. Thank you for being here this morning. Our next panel this morning consists of Mr. William Duncan and Mr. Paul Whitmore. Would you gentlemen please take the uh, witness table, please? Mr. Duncan and Mr. Whitmore in the audience. We're happy to have sitting in with us this morning uh, Congressman Bill Alexander of uh, Arkansas, former member of the Government Ops Committee. Um, and um, we're delighted to have you this morning, Mr. Alexander. Mr. Duncan, you and Mr. Whitmore would please stand. Um, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that it's been stated in the affirmative. This morning we have Mr. William Duncan. Mr. Duncan is a former special agent of the CID uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And accompanying him is Mr. Paul Whitmore, who is now the director and special agent training center of Glencoe, Georgia. Gentlemen, we uh, welcome you to the, uh, to the committee this morning. I appreciate very much uh, you being here. And I'd like to hear, uh, let Mr. Duncan, uh, if you would, uh, We'll hear your testimony at this time. 
Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, if you could pull the microphone just a little bit closer and speak right into it, it's a little sensitive. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Bill Duncan. I am a former special agent with, our, with Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigation Division. I am here today pursuant to your July 14, 1989 request for my testimony about the facts and circumstances surrounding my briefings by IRS Chief Counsel Disclosure Litigation Attorneys in preparation for my February 26, 1988 testimony under oath before the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime. The Subcommittee on Crime was looking into matters related to the smuggling organization of Adler Berryman Barry Seal and the related law enforcement investigations of alleged narcotics and money laundering violations by persons associated with or doing work for the organization. As you are aware, I am not authorized to disclose tax return information or grand jury information. Restrictions in my testimony concerning 6103 and 6E information will be based on the last definitions of tax return and grand jury information provided to me by the Internal Revenue Service and the United States Attorney, Western Judicial District of Arkansas, respectively. I was employed by the IRS Criminal Investigation Division as a special agent during the period December 1973 through June 16, 1989. From December 1973 through February 1987, I was assigned to the Little Rock, Arkansas District and worked both in the Little Rock District Office and the Fayetteville, Arkansas Post of Duty. From March 1987 until my resignation June 16, 1989, I was assigned to the Southeast Regional Office as Special Operations Coordinator. During 1985, I became involved in the aforementioned money laundering investigations as the IRS Criminal Investigation Division representative to a grand jury investigation in the Western Judicial District of Arkansas. During the conduct of these investigations, we encountered problems which made it difficult to effectively complete the investigations and present evidence to the grand jury. The frustrations of law enforcement officials and many of the witnesses ultimately came to the attention of the news media and the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime. Ultimately, I, along with other law enforcement officials, were requested to appear before the subcommittee to answer questions about problems we encountered in conducting the investigations and reasons for the lack of indictments. It was in connection with my testimony before the subcommittee that I became involved in the December 1987 through February 1988 briefing process by Mary Ann Curtin and Peter Philpy of IRS Chief Counsel Disclosure Litigation Staff. Initially, when I began talking with Curtin, I was under the impression that she, as my appointed legal representative, was the attorney assigned to me to ensure that I did not disclose tax return information or grand jury information. We quickly established that there was not going to be a problem with 6103 information because of the nature of the investigations, which were Title 31 money laundering. We also agreed on a definition of grand jury information, which we used for all communications until two days before I testified before the subcommittee. At that point, a new, much more restrictive definition was adopted after consultations with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I was surprised to learn, after the above matters were resolved, that Curtin's role was to encompass much more than advice on definitions of tax return and grand jury information. During our many telephone conversations, Curtin became aware of the problems we were experiencing in properly completing the investigations. She had instructed me that they wanted me to give truthful and factual testimony. Therefore, I was very surprised when during discussions about these problems, Curtin made me aware that she did not intend for me to candidly respond to questions from the subcommittee concerning the U.S. Attorney. I knew from conversations with the cooperating Arkansas State Police representative that an investigator for the Subcommittee on Crime had been in Western Arkansas interviewing witnesses concerning the manner in which the U.S. Attorney's Office was handling the cases. I felt certain that I would be asked specifically by the Subcommittee about the aforementioned problems and my opinion as an investigator about the status of the cases. Curtin told me that the IRS could not have me criticizing the United States Attorney, even if directly asked by the Subcommittee to describe problems and concerns I was to reply only that, quote, I would have done it differently or we would have done it differently, end of quote. Curtin was adamant that even if the subcommittee asked me 
14 to 15 years experience as a criminal investigator and dealings with various U.S. attorneys and grand jury investigations. Do you find the manner in which the U.S. attorney responded to requests for subpoenas for critical witnesses unusual? I was to respond only, quote, I would have done it differently, end of quote. I asked her what should be the response if I asked the follow-up question. How would you have done it differently? She stated that I was to respond only, I would have done it differently. She told me numerous times that I was not to express an opinion, even if specifically asked for my opinion. It was not a matter of volunteering opinions or information. It was a matter of truthfully and completely answering to the best of my ability questions posed by the subcommittee. I was going to be testifying under oath, not Curtin, and I was becoming very uncomfortable with the impression that I was getting from Curtin that the answers they were formulating for me in response to anticipated questions from the subcommittee was going to cause the subcommittee to conclude that I was either withholding information or not telling the truth. I had testified under oath many times during the course of my career, and I had never received instructions from anyone in IRS or Department of Justice about what exact words to use. I was always, it, correction, it was always understood that the testimony was to be truthful and complete. Prior to my trip to Washington to be briefed in person by Curtin, I became so uncomfortable with the counsel and instructions that I was receiving that I called my supervisor, Al Freeland, executive assistant to the Assistant Regional Commissioner, Criminal Investigation, and requested that if IRS was going to require me to work with an attorney, that I be assigned a different one. Freeland was sympathetic and stated that he would contact the National Office and make the request. I do not know who he contacted. However, it was eventually decided that I would have to deal with Curtin. During my early January 1988 briefings by Curtin, the aforementioned instructions were repeated and supported by Peter Philpy, her supervisor. Philpy told me after my complaint to him about Curtin's instructions that he had complete confidence in Curtin's instructions to me as set forth before in this statement. Neither he nor Curtin ever told me that I could give an opinion if asked for one by the subcommittee just as long as I made it clear that it was only my opinion and not the opinion or position of the Internal Revenue Service. If that option or position had been offered to me, I would have been comfortable with it. Paul Whitmore, Chief Criminal Investigation Division in Little Rock at the time, was present with me during these briefings. We were both extremely uncomfortable with the instructions and counsel which we were receiving. I had many discussions about, correction, we had many discussions about whether or not these attorneys had the authority to direct testimony in this manner. We came to no conclusion during these discussions about the authority of counsel to so instruct IRS employees. However, we both concluded in our discussions that what counsel was attempting to get me to do was wrong and would not only give the subcommittee a bad impression about my testimony, but would limit their access to information that they were entitled to have. We just didn't know what to do about it because I was directed that I had to deal with Curtin. My February 24, 1988 authorization to testify before the subcommittee stated that I was to testify under the guidance of government counsel. After conclusion of the early January briefings, I made several trips back to the Little Rock District Office for the purpose of photocopying non-grand jury information and documents to be furnished to the subcommittee. During one of these trips in February 1988, I received a telephone call from the cooperating Arkansas State Police Investigator Russell Welch, who told me that he had received information from a former law enforcement official concerning an alleged bribe from Barry Seal to a high-ranking government official. I immediately related this information to Marianne Curtin by telephone. Never was this information represented by the investigator, myself, or anyone else to my knowledge as evidence corroborated allegations or a fact. It was information, <coughs> excuse me, it was information received by Investigator Welch and Welch provided the information to me. This information did not become a matter of concern for me with respect to my testimony until Whitmore and I went to Washington to meet with Curtin for my final briefing on February 25, 1988. When the matter of the telephone call from Welch came up for discussion, Curtin was adamant that if the subcommittee asked me about an alleged bribe to the government official, I was to use these exact words, quote, I have no information, end of quote. 
I never in any way gave Curtin the impression that I wanted to volunteer information which, to my knowledge, had not been substantiated about this alleged bribe. However, if the subcommittee asked me if I had heard anything about an alleged bribe or if I had any information, it was my intention to simply relate that I had received the phone call and provide the context of the conversation. Curtin maintained the position that what I received during the telephone call was not information and that I would tell the subcommittee that I had no information. Several arguments ensued because I knew that if I told the subcommittee, quote, I have no information, end of quote, then I was going to be committing perjury. Curtin's directive to me did not change. She told me repeatedly that I should use the words, I have no information. This was not a friendly discussion between an attorney and client. It was an attempt by counsel, whom I was directed by IRS to use to control the very words that I would use in responding to questions. I knew from discussions with Welch that this subject had come up during his testimony, and if the subcommittee asked me questions along these lines, they probably knew that I, at a minimum, had received a telephone call from Welch. At some point during these arguments, Whitmore explained that we receive telephonic information from informants frequently and that the information is placed on a form 3949, which is titled Information Item for Evaluation. Curtin told Whitmore that the heading on the form should be changed because what is received during the telephone calls is not information. Curtin finally told me that IRS could not have an allegation about a bribe to this government official attributed on the front page of the Washington Post to an IRS agent. Believe me, I did, not want, I did not wish to have that happen either, but I believe that to be a remote possibility given the answer that I planned to give if asked about the alleged bribe. I doubted that a candid answer about the telephone call from Welch would have prompted what Curtin feared. In any event, I was not going to lie about having received the information. I asked Curtin for a second opinion from her supervisor. Curtin took Whitmore and I down to Peter Philpy's office. I told Philpy that I had serious concerns about what Curtin was telling me to do. Curtin repeated for Philpy her instructions for me to say, I have no information. Philpy agreed with Curtin and told me that what I received from Welch during the telephone call was not information, it's nothing. Again, we argued. I finally told Philpy and Curtin that if that was their final position, then I did not want to testify. I refused to respond with, I have no information. Philpy then said that if I was that uncomfortable, then, quote, we'll give you a little more grass to graze on, end of quote. They then agreed that I could tell the subcommittee that I have no personal information or no personal knowledge other than the telephone call from Welch. The problem here was what my assigned counsel attempted to get me to say. The atmosphere during these briefings was one of total control of wording everything. Only a very small part of my instructions had to do with 6103 or 6E information. At one point during the final briefing process, after a particularly heated argument about the words, I have no information, Curtin told me that Brian Sloan of the commissioner's office had asked her if she was worried about me with respect to my testimony. Curtin related that she told Sloan that I was very frustrated because of my dealings with the U.S. attorney and the lack of progress in the investigations. Curtin said that Sloan replied, well, Bill is just going to have to get the big picture. I took this very seriously and considered it to be a message from Sloan and or the commissioner that it would be best for me to do what counsel told me to do, especially with regard to the information about the alleged bribe. It is my understanding that Curtin and Philpy either did not recall instructing me as described or denied that they provided me with these instructions. I state emphatically to you under oath that I received the instructions as I have stated. In 15 and one half years of conducting criminal investigations and testifying under oath in numerous legal proceedings, I have always testified truthfully. I know what information is, and I also know what perjury is. Thank you very much. Mr. Whitmore, we will now receive your testimony. I believe that yours uh, has, has is it, you have, uh, well, yours will be uh, uh, in writing, or is it going to be oral? I did uh, give you one. You have a written statement. It's the same as what I would give orally, so whatever you wish. I don't have it. Not in my phone. 
Okay, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> but without objection, your entire testimony will be included in the record. Thank you. You might proceed. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for requesting my presence here today. I'm here today without representation. My testimony before you is to be truthful, and I will answer any and all questions to the best of my recollection as long as it does not involve disclosing any 6103 or 6E information. I've not knowingly violated any laws of this country, nor have I knowingly violated any Internal Revenue Service regulations or policies. I began my career with the Internal Revenue Service in May of 1970 as a special agent in the Intelligence Division in the Chicago District. In June 1975, I accepted a group manager's position in the Detroit District, Grand Rapids Post of Duty. In May 1977, I transferred to our Southwest Regional Office in Dallas, Texas as a regional analyst. In July 1982, I was selected as Chief of the Criminal Investigation Division in Little Rock District. I was in that position until April 1988 when I was transferred to my present position as Chief Criminal Investigation Training, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. It was in 1985, during the time I was Chief of the Criminal Investigation Division in Little Rock, that we became involved in investigating alleged money laundering activities in the Western Judicial District of Arkansas. It was because of these investigations that in December 1987, Special Agent William Duncan was requested to testify before a House Judicial Subcommittee. It was requested that Special Agent Duncan meet with and be advised by Attorney Mary Ann Curtin of the Office of Chief Counsel of Disclosure Litigation Division in preparation for his testimony before that subcommittee. I was present when Special Agent Duncan was prepared for his testimony. Just prior to one of these meetings, Duncan had received information from a law enforcement officer concerning a high-level government official's involvement with one of the individuals involved in our investigation. Special Agent Duncan gave this information to Attorney Curtin. She advised Special Agent Duncan that if he should be asked by a subcommittee if he had information concerning this government official, he should reply that he had no information. This became quite a heated discussion. We were uncomfortable with this advice, and Special Agent Duncan stated he could not give the advised answer because it was not true, as he did have information. Curtin said since it was unsubstantiated, it was not information. I disagreed. I said we receive information all the time which is unsubstantiated. We record the information on a Form 3949, and it is titled Information Item. It is our job as special agents to determine whether or not the information can be substantiated. She suggested something to the effect that we should change the title of the form, 3949, to something other than information item. Again, she told Duncan that he should answer the question that he had no information. He replied that if he gave that answer, he would be committing perjury. During the course of the discussion, Curtin remarked, how would it look in the paper if an allegation concerning a high-level government official was attributed to an IRS special agent? We countered with, how would it look in the paper if an IRS special agent lied to Congress? We could not accept her advice, so the three of us went to her supervisor, Mr. Peter Philpy, with our concern. Mr. Philpy agreed with Curtin's position, stating that what we had was not information, quote, it's nothing, end of quote. Special Agent Duncan stated that if he had to give that suggested answer, he would not testify before Congress. Only then did Mr. Philpy come up with an acceptable answer, that being something to the effect that although we did not have any direct knowledge, we did receive some unsubstantiated information. In another situation, Special Agent Duncan was advised that if he was asked his opinion on how the U.S. Attorney handled the aforementioned investigations, he should reply that he had no opinion. Again, this caused a heated discussion. I stated that everyone has an opinion and that he should be allowed to express his. Curtin made a statement to the effect she was glad I was not testifying before the Hill. After our meeting with Mr. Philpy and Marianne Curtin, we immediately advised the then Deputy Assistant Commissioner of Criminal Investigation of our problems with the disclosure attorneys. We also advised the ARCCI and the Executive Assistant to the ARCI Southeast Region. I have no knowledge of what action, if any, they took. It was nearly a year and a half later and only after Special Agent Duncan and I testified on June 8, 1989 about this situation before the investigators of the subcommittee did our inspection service respond. They responded by giving Special Agent Duncan and I an unannounced simultaneous interview on the morning of June 15, 1989. The inspectors that interviewed me were professional and courteous. However, the unannounced simultaneous interview is a technique usually used for targets of an investigation, not witnesses. 
The inspection service is comprised of well-trained criminal investigators who are very professional in their work. However, in my opinion, and I want to stress, it is my opinion, they are handicapped in investigating wrongdoing by senior Internal Revenue Service officials because of perceptions. Investigators doing the work are competent, but their bosses are senior Internal Revenue Service officials. To have the integrity the Internal Revenue Service maintain, it is necessary to have investigations of senior Internal Revenue Service officials conducted by an office separate from the Internal Revenue Service bureaucracy. By having a separate office conduct investigations of senior IRS officials, it would help alleviate the perception that IRS was protecting its own. Thank you. Gentlemen, I, I feel sure that I'm expressing the opinion of all the members of this panel this morning in complimenting you of coming here under oath, one former employee, one present employee, in a very responsible job, feeling that you have a responsibility to your country and the administration of a very important government agency to bring us this testimony. And I just want you to know we appreciate very much that you have been here today uh, and the role that you are playing. When you were interviewed by subcommittee staff, was the questioning fair and unbiased? Yes, sir. This and this and the investigators of this Commerce Consumer Monitor, did you feel like the questions were fair and unbiased? Yes, sir. Did you feel at all? Did you feel at all that the question was leading, and that you were inappropriately led to a conclusion? No, sir. Do you believe that all relevant facts and circumstances surrounding your complaint were covered? Yes. I, I believe they were. Yes, sir. Do you believe that the subcommittee intentionally or unintentionally avoided any relevant issues? No, sir. Mr. Duncan, you testified today that you were told to respond to a subcommittee's question in a way that would have caused you to commit perjury. Are you absolutely sure that you did not misunderstand or misinterpret the guidance provided you? Yes, I am absolutely sure. Are you absolutely sure that the quotes you relayed to the subcommittee are accurate? Yes, sir, I am. Do you, recur do you concur, Mr. Whitmore? Yes, sir. IRS attorneys told well, us let, when... Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. You said the quotes are accurate? Yes. Uh, some of the quotes, definitely, because uh, I have them myself. But there's a couple that he mentioned. Uh, I can't say the qu exact quotes are exact, but it was... Paraphrased. Yes. IRS attorneys told us under oath that you are given the options of expressing your personal opinions about the U.S. attorney's handling of the case, provided you gave the basis for your opinion. In addition, they said that you could have testified about the alleged bribe to the high-level government officials, provided that you were described the events that led to the receiving of the alle allegations. Is this so? That is absolutely incorrect. I would have understood that had I been offered that position. That would have made sense to me. Do you concur, Mr. Whitmore? No option was given on the opinion part. It was only after Special Agent Duncan would refuse to testify that he get an option how to answer the information part. Mr. Duncan, after you testified before the House Judiciary Committee in February of 1988, you told a number of individual, uh, individuals about the events that you described here today. Can you be specific about what each person told you about the advice that you were given, starting with the Regional Council, District C Disclosure Staff, the Deputy Assistant Commissioner for, cr for <coughs> Criminal Investigations in Washington, and the Assistant Regional Commissioner for Criminal Investigations in Atlanta. You Mr. might Chairman, just do that in order if you want me to repeat them. Uh, First can, the, Mr. Chairman, can I do that in the order that I furnish the information? It would be easier for me yeah, to do that. It, it, you do it in the order that you want to. Okay. As soon as I left my testimony with the Subcommittee on Crime, I went back and met with Mr. Whitmore. We went directly to the office of the Deputy Assistant Commissioner of Criminal Investigation here in Washington, Joe Pagani and related what had happened. Uh, I expressed my concerns that Chief Counsel's Office had attempted to get, get me to give false testimony to Congress. Mr. Bagani stated that uh, that's the reason that people don't like to use Chief Counsel's Office. He said they don't know what they're doing over there. He related that he in the past had refused to take Chief Counsel's Office personnel into testimony with him because of that. When I got back to Atlanta, 
uh, the first day I was back in the office, I met with Assistant Regional Commissioner of Criminal Investigation Dave Palmer, expressed the same concerns to him. Mr. Palmer's question to me was, well, you didn't lie, did you? And I told him, of course not. I also expressed my concerns to my immediate supervisor, executive assistants, to the Assistant Regional Commissioner of Criminal Investigation, Al Freeland, who was dismayed uh, about the treatment and instructions that I had received from Chief Counsel's office. Uh, I met with uh, disclosure, regional disclosure uh, person. Uh, that meeting occurred, I believe, Maury Detmer, acting executive assistant, was in that meeting also when I expressed my concerns to them. I don't think either of them knew how to react. I didn't get any instructions from them. My discussions with regional counsel came much later uh, after I refused to deal with the uh, chief counsel's office in connection with, I believe it was a request from Bill Alexander subcommittee or uh, a state prosecutor in Arkansas. I refused to deal with chief counsel's office and uh, I was requested to deal with regional counsel uh, concerning my potential testimony before the state prosecutor. Uh, when I told regional counsel Jack Morton and Ron Campbell about the incident and the instructions that I received, they were both very much dismayed and appeared very angry. Uh, I did not receive instructions from any of these individuals on what to do with the information, how to handle it, who to report it to besides themselves. Uh, I didn't receive any reaction other than basically dismay. Mr. Whitmore, did you accompany Mr. Duncan to any of these meetings? Uh, just the initial one uh, with uh, the Deputy Assistant Commissioner at that time, right after his testimony. Is his recollections accurate as far as you're concerned? Yes. Mr. Duncan, your testimony alleges misconduct on the part of the attorney who advised you for your appearance before the House Subject Committee on Crime. Did you report this misconduct uh, to inspection? I reported the conduct eventually after receiving a letter from the Assistant Commissioner of Criminal Investigation telling me who the appropriate authority, authorities were to report it to. And the instructions were to report it to the Inspector General, U.S. Treasury Department. Inspection did not have jurisdiction in this matter. Mr. Duncan, I understand that you no longer work for the IRS. That is correct. And Mr. Whitmore, I understand that you uh, do work for the IRS and are satisfied with your career there. Yes, sir. Uh, this being the case, what is your motivation for raising these allegations? Well, because I am satisfied with my career. I'm a special agent with the Criminal Investigation Division. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to work for the Internal Revenue Service. And the very uh, basic foundation of government service, the Internal Revenue Service, is integrity. And I, there's a very serious crack here in that foundation when our legal counsel gives us the type of advice that you've heard here this morning. Uh, Mr. Whitmore, what is your uh, role with the IRS today? You are the director? Well, thank you for the compliment or promotion. Uh, maybe as soon as I get back. Uh, you deserve the, it. I am the chief of the criminal investigation training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. I believe this was recently recognized by the president. Didn't he visit Glencoe recently? Matter of fact, the uh, president was there June 15th, and uh, that's the same day the two inspectors showed up, and I almost missed seeing our president. He didn't bring them with him, did he? No. I hope not. They were not on Air Force One. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mr. Duncan, I understand that you asked the disclosure litigation to send you a copy of the notes taken during your counseling session. Uh, when did you make this request? Mr. Chairman, I haven't talked to uh, disclosure litigation personnel since um, the day that I concluded my testimony before the subcommittee on crime. I made my request uh, through our National Criminal Investigation Division office I made the request several times because I wanted copies of the notes to uh, retrace the chronology, the dates of telephone calls with Curtin, the dates of meetings with Curtin, the context of those conversations that might be contained in those notes. I made repeated requests through uh, my national office and they were told at one point that uh, Curtin did not have her notes and then later uh, they furnished uh, Curtin's notes with respect to what went on in the subcommittee hearing. I have received no additional notes from them. I also made the request through the Inspector General's office, uh, through the Inspection Office, and I understand now that I'm going to be required to file a Freedom of Information request to obtain those documents. 
The reason, another reason I wanted those notes is because they were notes taken by what I understood to be my attorney assigned by the IRS. And I felt like I had a right to those notes and the information contained in the notes. Mr. Whitmore, when you first were interviewed by the subcommittee, uh, you were accompanied by two IRS disclosure litigation attorneys. Yes, yes, sir. What advice did they give you? To uh, take my time before answering a question uh, so that they could object if there was a possible 6103 or 60 uh, information I may uh, inadvertently uh, answer to. To be concise, answer the question, uh, not to expand on it. Well, what did you believe the reasons was for their company you to for the interview? To keep me from uh, disclosing 6103 or 6C information. What do you believe today was the purpose? I found out they did not represent me. I, I mean, that's one of the things I thought they were doing was representing me. I found out they represent the Internal Revenue Service. They are there not as my advisors or protectors, but to protect the Internal Revenue Service. And um, to report back, I found, uh, you know, to report back to whoever they report back to, the commissioner's office or whatever, on my testimony before the investigators. I, now, gentlemen, I want you to identify who is Mr. Filthy. I believe he is the chief of the disclosure litigation division for chief counsel's office. In Washington, D.C.? Yes, sir. And who is Mr. Brian Sloan? I understood him to be a, a personal assistant to the commissioner of internal revenue service in the commissioner's office. And uh, his role in this was what? Uh, I, I want to go back to that, Mr. Duncan. He, uh, the, he was finally the, uh, uh, the last person in Washington who, uh, who, uh, who made a, who, he was the final judgment as to what you were supposed to do, right? Mr. Chairman, I don't know what his role was other than I understood that he was a personal assistant to the commissioner and was communicating with Curtin uh, about my testimony. And I believe I believe that his signature is on a uh, a letter to the subcommittee concerning my testimony uh, prior to the actual authorization, but I don't I'm not sure what his authority was. But he I, just one second. But he did not he did not change the decision by Mrs. Curtin about what about what your instructions were to be. I never communicated with Mr. Sloan. To my knowledge, he didn't change anything. Um. I'm finished with my. Uh, You'll just uh, yes. follow up on yeah. your question. Who, who, are they, who are they trying to protect, or why are they? Who was it in the in the system that they're trying, or you, they're, you're trying to protect, or the lawyers were trying to protect? I can't understand. You were doing your job. You were looking at a at a, at a money laundering scheme, and and uh, you were really acting as professionals in that area. Who's the system trying to protect? Sir, there there was a perception among many people in western Arkansas that uh, there was a government cover-up and that was the reason that these cases were not being prosecuted uh, and that was one of my concerns and and the restrictions being placed upon me in my communications with the subcommittee um, I felt like the subcommittee was looking directly into those concerns expressed by citizens and and the witnesses some of whom had uh, place themselves in jeopardy, maybe with their personal safety and their jobs, to provide testimony and evidence to us. And I felt like the subcommittee was looking directly at these potential problems, and I was very concerned about that. Uh, Mr. Hastert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's interesting to uh, see your testimony develop today and to tie it in with testimony that we've had over the previous two days. One of the things that uh, concerns me as I see <coughs> facts starting to pile on facts is that there tends to be uh, a policy, and I'm, I'm sure that the IRS from the very top through the top echelons are, are very protective of, of, of what happens inside. Uh, do you say that this is almost, in your opinion, both Mr. Duncan and Mr. Whitmore, is there a policy here that says we protect uh, what goes out of this institution as far as policy and uh, 
uh, what problems we have internally? There is very much an atmosphere within the Internal Revenue Service, uh, an atmosphere of concern about disclosure of tax return information, about Privacy, Privacy Act matters, uh, and any time you get involved in, in dealing with something that is potentially uh, newsworthy, the Internal Revenue Service, it's been my experience, gets very paranoid about having the Internal Revenue Service related to that in any way. Mr. Whitmore. All the information you know, flows through uh, disclosure going out of IRS, or basically most of it does. Um, and integrity is our foundation. And it's their responsibility to maintain the integrity of, of the Internal Revenue Service. And I think they're very protective of what gets in the paper so our image would not be tarnished. And so I think they were fearful of some of these things getting in the paper and getting IRS's name attached that it could possibly tarnish or damage IRS's image. Well, you know, I, I can understand 6103 and 6E and those things, uh, matter of fact, are covered by statute. And, and I think they have a, a, a statutory uh, responsibility to be very careful about those types of disclosures. But when you talk about integrity, uh, in your opinion, when consul starts to put words in your mouth about what truth is, are we starting to breach, in your opinion, integrity? Was that a concern that you had? That was definitely my concern. Mr. Duncan? Well, initially, they were communicating to me, we want you to tell the truth, stick to the facts, just the facts. But as this scenario developed, it became apparent that they wanted me to testify to their definition of the truth, what they said the facts were, which was not accurate. Duncan, how many years did you work with the IRS? I began in December of 1973 and resigned June 16, 1989. And uh, spent 20 years uh, coming up, more than 73, more than 20. 73, uh, about 20, 15 years. 15 years. Uh, how come you, you gave up that service? The agony, uh, I could not reconcile what had happened with respect to this matter. Uh, it's something that I never reconciled. I lived with it for 16 or 17 months. Uh, there were additional requests for my testimony. Uh, and each time there was an additional request, I felt pressure to deal with these people again. I refused uh, to deal uh, these with people. disclosure litigation attorneys, uh, chief counsel staff, Mary Ann Kurt and Peter Philpy, the staff there. I was so dismayed by the counsel and, and instructions and directions that I had received from them, I absolutely could not go back and deal with them again. Where do you think that the policy being handed down to those attorneys, where was that policy coming from? Do you have any idea? I, I can't imagine. Uh, when I met uh, Curtin initially and Philpy, they appeared to be intelligent people. And I remember Paul and I looking at each other several times during this process it was nearly like being in the twilight zone. I'd been with the Internal Revenue Service many years and never experienced anything like this in any fashion. Who did uh, Curtin and Philippi, who were their immediate superior? I'm not certain about that, sir. What branch did they come from? Did they come from the commissioner's office? or? I don't know if they report directly to the commissioner, the, uh, the uh, people on the commissioner's staff. I don't know. You say that uh, both you and Mr. Whitmore, I think both of you said that when you gave testimony to our investigators <clears throat> that, they, that you were under the impression that those people were there to, to protect 6103, which we can understand. Uh, but also, you said then that you found out subsequently that those people really were representing the IRS, and they went back and reported verbatim what the, the interrogation was and what your answers were. Is that correct? I don't know if they went back and reported verbatim. They went back and made Accurately. it. Well, I would not even say that, sir. Uh, so what would you say? They reported back. How? You say they would not, they didn't report accurately. How I wasn't did? aware, but I, at the time that they, I thought they were representing me, but I found out subsequently they uh, reported back by a memorandum of what transpired uh, in, in, in the meeting. In were the, you given that memorandum so that you had access and could un say no, that this no. was accurate or not accurate? No, I was not. I wasn't even told of it. 
You weren't what? I wasn't even told that they were writing a memorandum or had wrote a memorandum by did, them. Did you subsequently ask to see a copy of that? Not from them. Who, who did you ask? Did you ask? Who, who did I ask? Did you ask somebody to see a copy of that memorandum? As Special Agent Duncan. Mr. Duncan, did you see a copy of that memorandum? Yes, I did. How did you get it? After I made my initial report, my written report, brief written report to Inspector General of the U.S. Treasury Department, um, these inspectors appeared suddenly on June 15, uh, unannounced, and during the process... That's June 15th of this year, right? Yes, yes. Go ahead. A appeared, uh, no, it was, uh, what was the date of that anyway? June 15th, when the June inspectors investigated. Okay, right. June 15. Uh, they appeared, interviewed myself and Mr. Whitmore simultaneously. They asked me to prepare a written affidavit. I was in the middle of closing out and preparing to uh, spend my last two days with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, I requested that I be allowed to spend the weekend putting together an affidavit accurately depicting the events and what had happened. Um, they allowed me to do that. They furnished me copies of blank affidavit forms that I was to use in preparing this affidavit. During the weekend, in the process of, of preparing my affidavit, I was going through the stack of affidavits, the blank affidavits, and using additional pages, and came upon these memorandums that evidently were inadvertently left in that stack of blanks. In your opinion, were those ac uh, affidavits accurate? My affidavit? What in the, the memorandum, I'm sorry, in your opinion, the memorandums that you discovered in that stack, were they uh, accurate uh, representation? I was very dismayed by what was contained in those memorandums. Uh, it appeared that there was a predisposition to discount uh, the allegations against uh, the advice or against the chief counsel attorneys that advised me. That's the way it appeared to me. It also appeared to me that uh, the memorandum that was prepared by the two attorneys that accompanied Mr. Whitmore was trying to give the impression that uh, there was no substance to the allegations or trying to make an impression on someone, I don't know whom, uh, that maybe this was not worthy of investigation. The two interviews that happened simultaneously you said it usually happens to people who are perpetrators against the law, not usually witnesses. Is that, did I hear that statement? I said that, yes. Uh, and do you agree, Mr. Duncan? Yes, I do. Do you feel that that was an intimidating uh, type of interview, or was it intimidating to you to have uh, to be treated like a, a, a somebody who's broken the law instead of somebody who's a witness? I, I was. Uh, I had I had communicated to the Inspector General's office investigator. Uh, earlier that week that I would cooperate in any way with any investigator that needed to discuss this with me. Um, the investigator with the Inspector General's office advised me that they might have local inspectors do the initial interview with me uh, since they were local there and there was some uh, problem with that, investi that investigator being involved in some other areas geographically. Um, I told him that I would prefer that they waited until the following week and that Monday of the following week would be a good day because I was right in the middle of trying to close out and prepare to depart. Uh, Mr. Whitmore, were you told about the memos that Mr. Duncan saw or did you actually see them physically? I have now seen them. Uh, do you think that those were accurate uh, representations of uh, your interview? They were slanted. Uh, How? trying to recall the exact word, and I wish I could have had a refresh my memory, but... Um, In your best... Well, they said that I was, they were asked, leading questions were asked of me, which was asked this morning by the chairman. I don't, I did not think any questions were leading. Um, and and I, you've been in the invest investigation business yourself for a long time, right? Yes, sir, 19 okay, years. Um, I did ask questions because I wanted to be sure, because before I went for the, the give testimony, I was told don't add anything, make sure you know what the question is. So I did not want to answer a question and reveal maybe more information than what the two attorneys would like me to, so I wanted to be sure I answered the question. So I would ask for clarification. Um, but I did not think the questions were leading. And uh, what other representations were in that memo that you disagreed with? Was there anything else? 
I mean, it was a, uh, there was representations about you in that memo, right, that was reported Yes, back it was, right. Um, I, th I think, if I remember right, there was a conclusion that they did not feel there was any substance to the question about the uh, type of advice Attorney Curtin had given us. And uh, I did not have that conclusion. I felt there was uh, definitely a breach of the... Uh, and, and in this memo was the whole discussion about what was the truth. I mean, the words that they were trying to put into Mr. Duncan's mouth, uh, basically saying that uh, what he felt was uh, what should be said, and, and what he could say in good conscience, and what he couldn't say in good conscience. Now, it was a relatively brief memo, just in summary, more or less. And where did that memo, where did it go, you know, who it was handed to? It was who, my, did the, who did the attorneys give that memo to? I assume that they gave it to Chief Counsel's office, and I think ultimately they also furnished a copy of that memorandum to the inspection service. The interviews that you had, or the interrogations that you had, the simultaneous... Well, it wasn't interrogation, it was an interview. Okay, interview. Do you feel that, do you feel intimidated by that in any sense? Not intimidated, I was uh, shocked to walk in and find two people waiting to see me and about the situation because uh, it was the day the president was there and I had a, a different agenda rather than talking to these two gentlemen, but I would have gladly given that statement I gave them that day at any time. I mean, if they would have called or whatever, but uh, I wasn't intimidated. I was just, I guess, shocked. Did you feel somewhat suspect when you found out it was a, the interviews went on simultaneously? Any time being in this business, uh, you walk in, there's two people waiting for you. Uh, you know, uh, your heart stops for a minute until they told me I was a witness, you know, not a target. Then I was able to find my office. Uh, Mr. Duncan, uh, I appreciate you coming before us today and testifying and uh, somewhat sad by people like you who have decided not to further serve their nation in the type of service that you've given in the past years. Uh, because of the pressures that you're put under. And Mr. Whitmore, I salute you for your courage because I know there are people sitting behind you that uh, are taking note of what you're saying right now. And certainly it's the intention of this body that, that you're not further intimidated by your courage and your statements. I think it's important. And I'm somewhat dismayed because of all this time and all this dialogue that's taking place uh, between the chairman and myself and uh, members from the highest part of the IRS who came in good faith to our offices and talked to us, you know, said, oh, we are open the doors. There's always cooperation. And evidently there wasn't cooperation. It gives me a great deal of sadness to find out that, that didn't happen. So I appreciate your testimony today, and I think it's very, very important uh, in, in this series of, of, of investigations and certainly looking into the IRS. And I share with you, I think integrity is important. And I think its integrity is important in this body it's important to the IRS, and it's important to the American people. And certainly when you have a, a, a function like the IRS that, that depends on people's good faith and honesty to deal with it, because if everybody wasn't honest and in good faith, we would never be able to function as a country, that uh, we have the types of cover-up that we have in the IRS. I think it's deplorable. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Hassett, can I uh, address the memorandums again? Uh, I got the impression from reading those memorandums that they had totally missed the point. Somebody had totally missed the point. It was like, well, Duncan didn't go in there and lie, so what's the problem? I felt like they totally missed the ethical issue, the fact that there was severe pressure to testify in a manner. Another concern I had was that it not happened to someone else because newer employees uh, tend to believe that they are in the presence of competent, honest counsel and they, if they are told, we want you to tell the truth, give the facts, and directed to testify in this manner, I think this could have turned out very differently in other situations. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the allowing you the rest of time. Um, let me announce to the, for the benefit of the committee that, as you know, we're going to have a long series of votes today, and, and certainly I want every member of the committee to have an opportunity to question these witnesses and the other witnesses. Uh, and uh, so therefore, I'm, I'm going to ask you that if you could limit your, your questioning it on the first round to 10 minutes, and then we will, uh, then we will go back and go.
go back and so that everyone will get a, get an opportunity. Um, because I think some of it would, would be repetitious. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Hassett and myself have taken more time than that. And I apologize, but since the, since I am the chairman, we will now uh, we will now move to ten minute um, ten minutes, and then we'll but we'll stay here as long as you would like to. And I'll also like to announce that that unless there's something very unfo un unforeseen happens, I do not plan to break for lunch, and that we will go on through. So. Mr. Martinez, with that uh, admonition, I will now recognize you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I probably should have taken my time in my short reign as chairman while you were out. That's right. <laughs> but I was not going to see to that. <laughs> but I think you've been generous in 10 minutes. I don't think I'll need the 10 minutes. I, I want to start out uh, almost to where Mr. Hazard left off. Uh, you know, one, uh, you and your careers have probably displayed uh, tremendous ethic and integrity. And courage, too. <clears throat> you see, you live that professional lie that somebody else is telling. And you live it, they tell a story about it. Uh, it's obviously evident to anybody who's been watching these hearings that there was, contrary to what the uh, other witnesses who are later on going to testify, and I'll quote from part of the testimony, uh, our uh, system of tax administration has been and remains a national treasure and the envy of the world. And they're living in this false world they created for themselves because the truth of the matter is, I don't think they're the envy of the world, but what's more important, they're not the envy of the citizen. The citizen doesn't have that high regard they have for themselves, and a lot of it results as not, not from the efforts that people like yourselves make or those people on the, on the, uh, in the front, uh, not in the front office, but down on the lower levels, the people that are dealing with the front line with so many of the uh, people they deal with who have encounter problems, not because they're trying to cheat anybody, but because they simply uh, sometimes don't understand the reporting laws which they're required to report and, and get into uh, problems and they're audited. But too many agents have sometimes developed the attitude of that, uh, I call them aristocracy of the uh, IRS. and that attitude prevails in, in the way they conduct themselves in the field. And yesterday we had testimony by one of the agents who said many times that happens. You know, if you have people above you who are irresponsible, or who develop a people uh, or an attitude of arrogance, and then they develop the same thing. And instead of being a service to people, they become a prosecutor of people. And that's wrong and that's bad. Uh, government is supposed to serve people, not uh, uh, hurt people. And this. Constantly, I've heard through your testimony and other testimonies uh, the need to not tarnish the image of the IRS. Well, there are some people in the IRS have, even though you've struggled hard to, to live up to certain standards and uh, create that kind of image, other people have tarnished it. And it's obviously being tarnished through these hearings to a greater extent than it ever has before, but it's always had some bit of a tarnish. Uh, what really strikes me in this thing is the difference of opinion. You know, now, there can be an honest difference of opinion. Uh, your opinion was that uh, Ms. Curtin acted unethically, but let me read you from that memo that you referred to. Based on the information which came out, of, out of, came out at Whitmore's interview, we believe that the allegations of wrongdoing on the part of Ms. Curtin is unfounded. That's like burying your head in the sand like an ostrich and everything's ha falling down around you, but you don't see it because you won't take your head out of the sand. And that seems in a lot of instances where people on a upper, higher level when they were, report were reported wrongdoing at lower said, forget it, don't worry about it, uh, and didn't think it merited, in some cases, very grievous infractions of ethic and, and moral conduct. Uh, thought it wasn't worth investigating or, or going any farther. We're going to receive testimony by someone who the obvious proof of their bad judgment is that that individual who they gave or denied uh, uh, a restoration of position and status was eventually overturned and that person was returned to the status he should have had for that period of time that he didn't have it. And yet that person is in a higher ranking position than they were then. It almost is like the Peter Principle. People rise up to their highest level of incompetence. And, and, you know, as I'm looking at this, and we're all entitled to our opinions, and maybe it's my own personal opinion, but I think it's shared by many people. 
that that's what's happened in the IRS over the years. And, and it's basically because uh, I liken it to a series that was on television before, and I think I've gotten a tremendous idea for a new series, The Untouchables. Only it won't be about the Prohibition days, it'll be about the IRS today. The Untouchables. Well, if the public becomes irate enough, they're not going to remain untouchable. I'm hopeful that new administration will change some of the attitudes. But basically, the one question I have of both of you is, how can anybody, how do you, in your minds, uh, see anybody justifying a statement like that, that there was no wrongdoing on the part of Ms. Curtis? How, how can that, how can anybody and any per pers person in position of responsibility come to that conclusion after what was evidently reported to them? You'd have to ask them. Tough question, isn't it? Um, well, I, I'm sure they're going to come up with some good answers, though, because uh, that's what they are professional at. Well, you're professional at doing what you've done in, in a very good way, fine way. They're professionals at the cover-up, and that's what's happening here. You know, I, I see this thing as bad as anything that's ever happened in government because it's happened with an agency that is uh, entrusted uh, with a grave responsibility of administering our tax laws. Uh, you know, it's this kind of action that really led to the first revolution. And although we're not about doing that today, I think there's got to be a revolution in government uh, to clean itself up, and especially in the IRS. I have nothing further to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Schiff. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. There's one area I'd like to get into. Uh, the, the, the major portion of your testimony has centered about what I regard as an incident involving advice you received from an attorney for the IRS prior to testifying. I, I don't, advice that you, uh, you considered unethical at the least. I don't want to um, uh, suggest that that is not a serious situation, what you've described, but leaving it there, it's one incident of, of one situation in a large agency, uh, um, with many offices around the country. What I think the focus of our inquiry is, and should be, is the attitude of the Internal Revenue Service as an institution towards an allegation, whether or not the allegation is ultimately provable, I might add, but towards an allegation that something inappropriate has happened. I wonder if you could go back, you, you mentioned some of it, but I didn't entirely follow. Um, following this, um, following this particular advice that you received, that obviously you were both uncomfortable with, um, what occurred in terms of your reporting it to higher authority within the IRS? Could either of you gentlemen say? As soon as I concluded my testimony before the Subcommittee on Crime that very day, within an hour, uh, Mr. Whitmore and I were in the Deputy Assistant Commissioner's office, Mr. Pagani's office, relating what had happened See, much of what occurred, most of what occurred, I guess all of what occurred on the information issue uh, in, in personal briefings occurred on the day before, the 25th. Uh, it was more or less an all-day affair. And we went until late in the day. So that was the first opportunity that we had to discuss this with the, the Deputy Assistant Commissioner. All right. And uh, was, was the Deputy Assistant uh, Commissioner, was that your next hire superior at that time? No, sir. He was, I had worked for Mr. Bagani uh, when I first went to the regional office. He was Assistant Regional Commissioner of Criminal Investigation for Southeast Region before he became Deputy Assistant Commissioner here in Washington. How much higher was that than your present position? That's well, what that's, I'm trying, that, that position at the time I meant. That's, uh, it's the number two man in the criminal criminal investigation division that, nationwide. That's a high position then? Yes. And uh, did that gentleman take any action that you were aware of uh, on your complaint? I don't know that he, I don't know what Mr. Pagani did with the information we furnished. He was sympathetic. Uh, he related that he had before not used the people. He indicated they didn't know what they were doing and that's the reason that people, this type of thing is the reason that people don't want to use the office. What I'm getting at, let me ask it from another direction, please. Here you, you had an experience that you thought was inappropriate. And I don't, I don't, it sounds inappropriate to me, but I'm not seeking to make that determination. The point is you thought it was inappropriate and you brought it to a supervisor, a high-level supervisor, a high-level manager, 
to the best of your knowledge, did any action or inquiry result from the IRS in view of the complaint you brought to, their, to uh, a superior's attention? I don't believe that any investigation was conducted. I don't believe that this information was furnished to anyone in authority to investigate it until uh, I made the written report to Treasury IG. I didn't know who to take the information to. Right. And when you made that written report, did they make an inquiry? Yes, they did. Right. Were you satisfied with the nature of that inquiry? My dealings with Treasury I IG have been satisfactory. They, they appear to be uh, attempting to investigate this. The only concern I had was that I was told that they have authority in the investigation because it involved an IRS employee at the GS-15 or above level and, and that inspection did not have authority to investigate this. The next thing I know, uh, two investigators from inspection are the ones that appeared. And I want to make a point that these two inspectors treated me courteously also. They conducted a very thorough interview but I got the distinct impression that they were not comfortable being involved in the investigation because they weren't the case agents. They were from another section. But the point is, action started when you addressed the Inspector General of the Treasury Department, which is outside of the Internal Revenue Service. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back any time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coulter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I too, want to thank these two gentlemen for uh, their work here this morning. But Mr. Chairman, I feel very awkward at this point. I'm going to ask for your help, the help of the committee and our counsel here. Uh, because uh, part of the testimony of Mr. Duncan's, if with your permission, I'm going to read the part that bothers me here. It says, uh, next to the last page, you're referring to a, uh, the final briefing with Curtin, in which it was mentioned that Brian Stone of the commissioner's office had asked her, so on and so forth. Because I took this very seriously and considered it to be a message from Sloan and or the commissioner. Now there is an insinuation, there is a suggestion that possibly the commissioner was part and parcel part of the problem. And in two days of testimony, this is the first time this has come before us. And I would wonder if you would consider amending your statement to read rather than a and or the commissioner the office of the commissioner, that which would be more precise, mm -hmm. more correct. Uh, that would be more correct because I don't know who it was a message from. I don't know why else Curtin would have brought that up at that point in time. It was, it was a point that she made very emphatically, and it was at a very inappropriate time if it was not a message from either Sloan or the commissioner or the office. I don't know who it was a message from, but she did tell me that Mr. Sloan was a, an assistant to the commissioner. You see, many times we who are elected officials uh, who have huge staffs working for us, large staffs, never enough, uh, somebody <laughs> down the lower level sometimes makes statements or do things that we are totally embarrassed with. Mm -hmm. But we knew nothing about it for two or three years, and possibly this could be the case with our commissioner, the former commissioner. So I would ask you to consider the possibility of making an amendment to your statement. That, hey, would that be fair, Mr. I Chairman? don't think, uh, let me just say, I don't see why he needs to make an amendment to the thing. I mean, you've asked him a question. He's given you his opinion and his explanation of what he has said. I think it's pretty well generally known uh, in the organization and outside the organization uh, that Mr. Sloan held a very responsible position and he reported directly to the commissioner. Now, it's, we don't stating that as fact. Uh, he's just stating that is his opinion. So I have no... I have no problem with his statement as it was uh, first prepared. Well, it bothers me, Mr. Chairman, because he considers it to be a message from and or the commissioner. He, well, he so. said he considers it. He didn't say he had a direct information to that degree. Uh, I want you to understand the, the context in which I was being brief and preparing to testify. I had spent many months and years conducting investigations and was getting a lot of feedback about people suspecting because there were no indictments, because the investigations didn't appear to be coming to a conclusion, that there was complicity in very, at very high levels in government with perhaps uh, an international smuggling organization. And the reasons they were giving for that is because they had heard that Mr. Seal was involved with the CIA, with the Drug Enforcement Administration, and these are the types of rumors and information that I was receiving. I didn't know what I was involved in. I didn't know what was going on. That is the way I felt. 
And if you want to permit the commissioner's office, I'm not making direct allegations against the commissioner of internal revenue. I'm telling you what I felt at the moment during that briefing process. I felt very intimidated. And the pressure was excruciating for me to testify in that manner. I felt like I was on a tight rope all alone at about 5,000 feet with no backup. I felt very much alone. Mr. Duncan, I can understand that. I just want the record to show that uh, uh, you clearly did not say that the commissioner was involved, but you thought there was a possibility. Well, I, I won't say that. I'll tell you that I felt like there was a message coming out of that office, whether it was the commissioner, the assistant co to the commissioner. Why else have that conversation? Uh, Precisely, that was my precise request, mm -hmm. making a change to the office of the commissioner. Well, if, you, if you're more comfortable with that, th that, that's fine. I'm just, I related honestly my concerns and my feelings in my statement. Well, really, that's not important as, as, as long as it's a matter of public record that there is a question about that. Okay, sir. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Um, Mr. Duncan and Mr. Whitmore, I, um, the last, um, you retired in June of this year. I, I resigned effective June 16th. June the 16th. And it was June the 15th, I believe, when the uh, unannounced investigators appeared. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, um, exactly how did that, tra uh, 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 you say unannounced. You, didn't, you had no previous knowledge that they would be there. That's correct. Oh, tell me the scenario of that day. I walked uh, into the office. Uh, it was the morning that the, pre the president was going to be at Glencoe, and uh, there was a lot of preparation going on uh, for him being there. Uh, families were coming in to be able to see him. Uh, I walked into the office, and there was um, a lady and a gentleman standing there. Uh, they identified themselves as inspectors. Uh, they said they were from Washington. They flew in late last night, and it was very important they talked to me. And I said, fine. I said, uh, and like I said, I had a hard time finding the office at the at, for a moment until they told me they were there. As, I was a witness, not a target of an investigation. Um, I asked, could this wait till after the president gave his address? I'd like to be there. And they said it was important that they take my statement from me immediately. And uh, I said, fine. I said, I'd like a little bit of time when they explained what the situation was. I said, since this is going to be a, a very critical statement, uh, affidavit, I'd like to have a little time so I can write it properly. Uh, I wasn't worried about the accuracy of it, but I wanted to, to write it so it would read well. Um, they said, well, whatever you need, just hurry, and, and they wanted it done immediately. So within an hour, they had their statement, they made a phone call, and uh, they were gone. Uh, well, now, I just felt uncomfortable. I had the Im impression that Mr. Duncan, Mr. Duncan was present at the time that you were I was in uh, Glencoe, Georgia. Uh, Mr. Duncan was in Atlanta, Georgia. It was approximately 300 miles uh, in between, and that's what the inspectors told me after they took my statement, the reason why they took it in the manner they did, unannounced, and wanted me to get it in writing and uh, sworn to, because Special Agent Duncan was being interviewed simultaneously up in uh, Atlanta uh, to see that the, the two see. statements were our own statements and that we didn't cooperate on them. Now these were, ins these were representatives, uh, inspectors of the IRS. Yes, sir. They were not from the uh, IG. That's correct. Uh, what was the, what was, uh, what, uh, what was the, the affidavit, what, it, what was contained in the affidavit? I mean, what did you, what did they ask you to cover in the affidavit? Basically, the statement I read this morning, and which you have, uh, Mr. Chairman, is what was covered in the affidavit, the advice that was given during our uh, preparation for uh, Mr. Duncan's testimony before the other subcommittee. And Mr. Duncan, uh, uh, what was your experience on June the 15th? When I arrived at work that morning uh, in the regional office, uh, the inspectors were in, I believe they were already in my supervisor's office. I didn't, uh, I didn't know, I was not privy to that meeting. Shortly thereafter, my supervisor came back and told me to, to make sure that I stuck around, that uh, inspectors needed to talk to me. Um, about 15, 20 minutes thereafter, I was called up to the front of the office and introduced to the two inspectors who interviewed me. Were the same inspectors at both places? No, they, it was impossible. It was simultaneous. We were oh. Same time, okay. Right. Um, and, you're, and, the, and the people that interviewed you were likewise from Washington. Yes, that was my understanding. And uh, the testimony, that, uh, the, did, you, did you give them an affidavit? 
not at that time because I didn't feel like I could com effectively complete a thorough, uh, detailed affidavit like I should uh, with the time constraints that I had at the moment. And so they allowed me to do that over the weekend. But I did give them a full interview. Uh, and did you sign an affidavit? Yes, sir, I Properly did. Properly witnessed? Yes, I did. That occurred on uh, the 20th, I believe, the next Tuesday. Um, out of courtesy to one of the members, I, um, I think we would probably at this time, for no longer than five or ten minutes, we will recess and uh, uh, reconvene at no later than 11.30. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, amend that, please. I think that the, but there will be some continuations in voting, and with that being the possibility, we will not recess. We'll just uh, maintain the meeting. Uh, Mr. Duncan and Mr. Whitmore, I, I know that Mr. Uh, Alexander wanted to express his uh, appreciation uh, for you being here today, and as well as the courage to come forth and bring this testimony, and I want to speak for him in that regard. Uh, but in the interest of time, we will have to move on, and I want to thank you again on behalf of the committee, uh, and uh, thank you for this testimony. Thank you. Subcommittee will come to order. I want to repeat that uh, we are sort of operating in a un uh, stress situation right now, and much we got a defense authorization bill on the floor, and there's a lot of votes, and we've just uh, had a one vote, and going to have another five-minute vote, and I'm a little concerned that uh, all the members will not get back timely, uh, but time is of the essence, and I certainly don't want to take any more this panel's time than uh, we've already taken. But I want to certainly welcome all of you to the, uh, to the hearing this morning. Appreciate much so much of you being here. Uh, let me uh, introduce the uh, panel this morning. We have Mr. Fred Goldberg, who is the Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, and he's accompanied by Mr. Michael Murphy, the Senior Deputy Commissioner. Uh, we have with us Mr. Larry Gibbs, the former Commissioner of Internal Revenue Service, who is Certainly no stranger to this uh, panel, to this committee. And I might say that we work very, uh, very uh, comfortably and uh, with in the, in the past years. And it's good to see you again and hoping that your endeavors in the private sector are uh, not only profitable, but likewise a little bit more, less stressful than what you had in your, I hope you've advised Mr. Goldberg with what his, uh, because he's having been with the IRS before, I think he comes well, well prepared. Uh, Mr. Goldberg, would you, uh, uh, would, would you please introduce those who are accompanying you this morning? Yes, Mr. Chairman. At the far end of the table is uh, Jim Cately. Mr. Cately is the Associate Chief Counsel Litigation in the Chief Counsel's Office of the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, next to Mr. Cately is Bruce Milburn. Bruce is the Assistant Commissioner, Criminal Investigations. Uh, he reports to the Deputy Commissioner, Operations. And next to me is Teddy Kern, the Assistant Commissioner Inspection, who reports directly to the Commissioner. And um, we will take the testimony in this order. We'd like to hear from Mr. Goldberg first, Mr. Murphy, and then Mr. Gibbs. And uh, let me just say, as always, uh, your entire testimony, without objection, of all three of you will be included in the record. And we will leave it up to you as to you how you might want to summarize. And uh, Unless time is of a problem with you, then we will wait and have the questions following all three testimonies. Mr. Goldberg. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I also have a little matter to, to uh, tend to, and that is, with, will all of you please stand? Uh, we have sworn in all of the witnesses, so we won't make an exception at this time. 
Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so up your God? I do. Let the record confirm it was in the affirmative. <coughs> Mr. Goldberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin my testimony, I'd like to take this opportunity to personally and publicly thank every current and former IRS employee who has testified before you during these hearings. I think they have done the Internal Revenue Service, and I think they have done the public a public service by coming forward, and they have my personal gratitude and my personal thanks. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I'm the, uh, the new kid on the block. This is my, my maiden voyage before the Congress as Commissioner of Internal Revenue. As such, I am particularly pleased to appear before a committee that plays a major role in fostering good government. Without question, effective, vigorous, and ongoing oversight is essential to sound tax administration. Oversight by the Congress, oversight by the General Accounting Office, oversight by the Treasury Department, and the Treasury Department's Inspector General, oversight by the IRS Internal Security Division and Internal Audit Division, oversight by the public, and oversight by the press. We must be willing, and we are willing, to openly and candidly discuss and address the challenges and the issues facing this most important agency. Over the years, your oversight committee has taken the lead in focusing us on areas such as taxation, u application of the U.S. tax laws to U.S. citizens living abroad, the Internal Revenue Service Information Returns Program. I believe that the result of those efforts has been a better, a more efficient, and a more effective system of tax administration. In this same vein, I am con confident, I am absolutely convinced that your hearings this week, the investigation that has taken place during the past 14 months, will enhance our system of tax administration. A number of initiatives are underway. I assure you that others will be forthcoming as we seek to minimize the instances of employee misconduct and enhance our ability to detect, investigate, and to deal firmly and surely when, with such incidents when they do arise. Mr. Chairman, as a former IRS employee and as a private practitioner for, for much of my, my professional life, I have only the highest regard for the integrity of the Internal Revenue Service as an institution. I am confident that my colleagues in the private sector and my colleagues in the government share that view. Over the years, I have found IRS employees at all levels to be dedicated, hardworking, honest professionals who value their integrity and value the integrity of the institution above all else. The IRS possesses one attribute above all others, which is essential to its mission. And that's a workforce that does not condone wrongdoing within its ranks. And I think the testimony you've heard from current and former IRS employees is a reflection of that attitude. I'd like to comment briefly on a number of matters uh, before, uh, that have been before the committee during the investigation and during these hearings. First, I am aware of concerns that have been raised regarding cooperation by the IRS or lack of cooperation by the IRS during the course of the subcommittee's investigation. Likewise, I am aware of concerns that have been raised as to the conduct of the investigation itself. My personal view is that little is to be gained by arguing over who struck John. The fact is that the subcommittee, in my view, 
has accomplished its mission as a result of your efforts, our shared objective of an improved system of tax administration will be achieved. With respect to the alle underlying allegations of misconduct considered by the subcommittee, during the past several days, we have heard, you have heard, the public has heard detailed instances of bad judgment, misconduct, and potential criminal wrongdoing by IRS employees. A number of these cases have been referred to the Justice Department for criminal pro possible criminal prosecution. I can see little to be gained from dwelling on the details of each matter considered by the subcommittee. As in all human endeavors, there's another side to the story. There may well be many other sides. But let me make myself clear. These issues are too important. They are too serious to spend the next six months or next year arguing about the details. I have seen enough to know that there are issues that need to be addressed, there are management concerns that need to be addressed, and we must address them. I must also say mistakes have been made. Mistakes will always be made. We are an organization of 120,000 employees working throughout the United States and abroad. In any organization our size, there will be instances of bad judgment or misconduct, occasional instances of wrongdoing. There's no final solution. The key is eternal vigilance regarding the integrity and conduct of our employees and our workforce. I'd like to comment on the IRS inspection function. The internal security and internal audit activities performed by IRS inspection are essential to assuring the integrity of our workforce, they are essential to ensuring the integrity of our programs. As you know, it's important to be very clear about this, the Assistant Commissioner Inspection reports directly to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue to the Senior Deputy Commissioner. I view the successful performance of its duties, the inspection function's duties, as essential to carrying out our mission. Our inspection function does have a proud history of major accomplishments. From what I hear, in the views of many, our inspection function indeed is second to none in the federal government. But the concerns that have been raised here over the last several days are very serious. It is clear that we can improve the inspection function. I assure you, we will improve the inspection function. We must make certain that that function is adequately funded. As you know, the IRS is operating under a hiring freeze that is likely to extend into 1990. The, the inspection function, is, as I understand it, is exempt from that freeze. Indeed, has been allocated additional resources. I will review that question. If more resources are required, more resources will be provided. The inspection function cannot perform its mission without adequate training, without an adequate grade structure. I have no reason to believe that these matters are, or there are serious problems associated with these matters, but there may be. I will look, and I assure you I will address those concerns. As you heard this morning, our old inspection management information system was inadequate for certain key management purposes. Mr. Chairman, it was inadequate. It wasn't doing the job. As I understand it, we are working with the GAO at this point to develop a management information system that will perform its necessary functions, will permit the Inspector General, and will permit the Congress to perform its oversight, perform their oversight responsibilities. We're going to get it right, and we're going to do it till we get it right. Our employees must feel free to communicate with the inspection function when they observe misconduct by a colleague. As you know, we are one of the few institutions in this country, public or private, that has a code of conduct requiring each and every one of our employees to report acts of wrongdoing and apparent acts of wrongdoing by their colleagues. Now, based on my understanding, that close to 50% of the inspection cases that 
that are referred each year are referred by our employees. As I understand it, the fact that the cases considered by this committee uh, involve instances where there had been prior referrals makes me think that that system may be wor is working reasonably well. But it's clear that it can be improved. We have ethics initiatives underway, mm -hmm. ethics awareness program, training program for all of our employees. We are developing a hotline that will permit referrals directly to, to the national office inspection function so that individuals uncomfortable dealing with the field will be permitted to deal with the national office. We are reviewing a number of our, our investigatory procedures. We can and must make our employees feel comfortable in coming forward with instances of wrongdoing. The Inspector General. As you know, the Inspector General currently has significant responsibility and authority over the IRS inspection function. As I understand it, all conduct cases involving senior IRS managers, other sensitive cases are referred to the Inspector General. Likewise, the Inspector General can initiate cases involving IRS personnel on his own. And all IRS employees have been given a hotline number so they can refer matters directly to the Inspector General without going through the IRS inspection. Finally, under applicable Treasury Department directives, the Inspector General has the responsibility and has the authority to assess inspections quality on a programmatic basis. Now, Mr. Chairman, I am very well aware that there are some who feel strongly and sincerely that in certain inspection functions should be moved directly to supervision under the Inspection General. On the other hand, as I'm sure you've heard, and I've conducted no formal survey, my sense is that most experienced tax professionals familiar with the workings of the IRS think this would be a fatal mistake. Others believe the IRS should have its own appointed inspector general. Let me assure you, I have not prejudged this question. I will not reach any snap decisions on this issue. I will give it full and fair consideration. In the meantime, we are actively pursuing steps to enhance the IRS inspection function, including those described above. I have also requested of senior Treasury Department officials that the Inspector General conduct ongoing quality reviews of various inspection program activities on a systematic basis. Now, I should emphasize that this request does not reflect a prejudgment that anything is seriously amiss. My understanding is that the inspection function does its job reasonably well. Rather, it is based on my belief that we can improve the inspection function, and it is based on my conviction that we must have an effective, dynamic inspection service. Finally, I am working with the Treasury Department and hope to work with you and your colleagues in the Congress to provide the Inspector General with resources adequate to do his job of helping to ensure that IRS inspection does its job. All the words in the world won't pay for it. We need to be sure they have the money. The criminal investigation function. Without question, IRS special agents responsible for pursuing tax crimes are the most capable group of professionals anywhere at investigating instances of financial wrongdoing. There's an article in the wa big front page article in the Washington Post last week detailing one such instance uh, of, of great notoriety in this area. They play a very important and effective role in promoting voluntary compliance with our tax laws. Their skills make them essential members of multi-agency task forces responsible for pursuing those involved in money laundering, narcotics trafficking, and the like. The nature of our criminal justice process is such that we must have rigorous controls. We must have checks and balances to protect the rights of taxpayers who are potential targets. We must also go to great lengths to prevent misconduct and to prevent the appearance of misconduct by our special agents and their managers. My sense is that the myriad rules, regulations, and procedures that have developed over the years 
generally achieve their intended purpose. The rights of individual taxpayers are protected. Our special agents do adhere to the highest possible standards of professional conduct. Once again, however, it is clear, these com this committee's proceedings have made clear, that our system is not perfect, our employees are human. They will make mistakes, they have made mistakes. As a result of the subcommittee's investigation, a number of our procedures have been modified or clarified. I am confident that as we continue to learn the lessons of the past several days, we will take additional steps to enhance our checks and balances. I am also quite certain that during my tenure as commissioner, there will be those who will say, Mr. Commissioner, we must scrape away the red tape. There are too many controls, too many checks. We need to get more efficient. Mr. Chairman, these hearings will be a vivid reminder of why those controls are in place. Public awareness. News release announcing this hearing states the service glorifies the agency's public image at the expense of aggressive investigation and punishment of wrongdoing. I beg to differ. My personal view, and I hope and believe the view of the institution, is as follows. The public knows we make mistakes. The public doesn't want an agency that says, see no evil, hear no evil. We enhance our image. When the public knows that we discover, investigate, and deal with wrongdoing in our ranks, they know it happens, they expect us to deal with it. That same publicity, as a manager, makes it easier to do our job if our own employees know that we uncover, investigate, and deal with wrongdoing, it enhances the agency's ability to police its conduct. If our employees don't believe we're doing that job, we have a problem on our hands. I'm well aware of the frustrations that 6103 and Privacy Act disclosure laws can create. But confidentiality of taxpayer information, the individual's rights to privacy and due process are essential to our system of voluntary compliance. They embody fundamental values of our society. The short-term expedient, our short-term expedient of being able to disclose, to lay out in public information about taxpayers and information about our employees, I believe must give way to far deeper concerns. Again, as I said, despite the manifest frustrations with 6103, despite our frustrations with 6103, I believe that your investigation has, and, and these hearings have accomplished a very important function. We're going to be a better Internal Revenue Service for it. There are serious problems we have to deal with. I think it's important to keep perspective, and, and Mr. Chairman, this is a tough one. We are a very large organization. I believe that our tax system is a national treasure. It is the envy of the world. I'm as proud as I can be to be part of it. I think the 120,000 employees we have are honest, decent, hardworking individuals. The hard part is I don't want to say or do anything to minimize the seriousness of the concerns you've raised. If one of our employees is engaging in an act of misconduct, that's one too many. And when I say we need to keep this in context, what I am saying is if we do not address the issues you have, cons you have raised, a tax system that is the finest in the world may no, will no longer stay that way. We have to deal with these concerns, but right now, where we are is a system that works and works well. I have a bit in my testimony about priorities. As you know, system modernization, the information returns program uh, that you're interested in, the, the need for additional budget formulation and execution accountability are very important questions. But I want to dwell on those today because I think the issues you've raised are matters of concern. In my opening statement in my confirmation hearings, I identified quality 
is a number one priority. The cornerstone of that quality is a workforce committed to and functioning at the highest standards of integrity. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your time and attention. I'd like uh, Mr. Murphy to have an opportunity to make a statement. Mr. Murphy, in reviewing your testimony, I believe it's about uh, 30 minutes. So you uh, plan to? No, I don't, Mr. Chairman. With your permission, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to summarize. I have some talking notes, and I'd be. I well, without know. objection, your entire testimony will be included in the record, and you can summarize as you see fit. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, based on my knowledge of the subcommittee's investigation. I would like to begin by making several general compliment, or comments. First, Mr. Chairman, I'm confident that a subsequent review will show that the IRS has worked with the subcommittee to the extent allowed by law and to the extent that disclosure would not jeopardize any ongoing matters. Second, we believe that the allegations of misconduct that have been investigated by the subcommittee are instances perhaps isolated instances that should not detract from the overall integrity of the workforce. I believe the Commissioner has made a similar comment. Finally, as the Commissioner indicated, Mr. Chairman, the IRS has undertaken a series of actions to strengthen our system of internal controls and to improve our general management practices. Based on our findings and your findings, we will reevaluate the steps that we have taken and also consider any additional corrective actions that may be necessary. Mr. Chairman, as the senior responsible career official in IRS, I've looked at our structure, I've looked at our internal control, our management to determine whether any verified misconduct is occurring in places other than those investigated or, or whether or not they could occur again. I've also taken into account any findings by other oversight agencies or organizations, including the GAO and Inspector General. My review leads me to conclude that our organizational structure is basically sound and that the systems of reviews work properly to call management's attention on any areas that are cause for concern. Mr. Chairman, on page three of my testimony, I get in a little bit to what history brings to this point, and I'd like to share some of that with you and members of the subcommittee. The history of IRS over the past several decades provides valuable insight into the IRS of today. Thirty-eight years ago, following an intensive congressional investigation, IRS was revamped to protect it from outside political influence and to provide a system of internal controls that would guard against wrongdoing. One of the more significant actions, Mr. Chairman, was the establishment of an independent inspection organization reporting directly to the commissioner. In any decentralized organization of over 120,000, and I believe the commissioner made this point, there are a few individuals who will bend or break the rules for their own benefit. I'm not here, as the commissioner mentioned, to say that misconduct never occurs in an organization this large. But when the rules are monitored, by a well-staffed and professionally trained inspection workforce, and when prompt and appropriate disciplinary action is taken where misconduct is substantiated, then breaches of integrity are kept to a minimum. The Watergate hearings are also important to an understanding of the institutional fabric of the IRS. Following Watergate, Congress enacted the Privacy Act of 1974 and substantially revised Section 6103 of the Internal Revenue Code. That was done in the Tax Reform Act of 76, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the, the three of the provisions restricted access to tax information by members of Congress and members of the administration, strengthened the penalties against IRS employees and the agency for unauthorized disclosures, and imposed a comprehensive set of administrative safeguards. The importance of protecting the privacy of a taxpayer's tax information is strongly emphasized to all IRS employees from their very first day on the job. Although these provisions have been the source of frustration to the subcommittee staff throughout this investigation, and I'm talking about the disclosure provisions, I firmly believe that this government must consciously continue to protect its citizens' rights to privacy. 
On page five, Mr. Chairman, I talked a little bit about the oversight role and our commitment to cooperate. As you requested, we furnished an entire database of investigations conducted by IRS inspection over a four-year period under review by your subcommittee. We also made available our inspection reports on investigations of, of alleged misconduct to the subcommittee. We furnished over 35,000 pages of documents and facilitated more than 90 interviews with the employees. The only constraint on interviews are the furnishing of materials has been the statutory bar which prohibits IRS from releasing tax information to the subcommittee unless authorized by Congress to do so or a decision by the Department of Justice that disclosure of, of case-related tax information would interfere with an ongoing criminal matter. These constraints were discussed with you early on, Mr. Chairman. On pages 6, 7, and 8, we talked a little bit about the subcommittee's investigation. And I'd like to give you my points on, on putting this in perspective. The subcommittee has focused its investigation on a handful of allegations of misconduct among nearly 1,500 senior officials in IRS who are grade 15 or above. I'd like to point out there are 300 executives, Mr. Chairman, that are part of the executive cadre of IRS. And as senior deputy commission, I am chairman of the executive resources board. There are a small number of those 300 that have been discussed. And I will come back to the point again about even one is something that has to be investigated and investigated right away. Most of the cases, Mr. Chairman, involve former employees from the testimony that's been given to date. It would appear that the subcommittee's findings are similar to those of our own investigators. All of the cases reviewed by the, sub by the subcommittee have been investigated by the IRS and when appropriate, they have been referred for prosecution. Because of the investigation conducted by the subcommittee, you certainly may have additional information which did not come to light during our investigation. I think that this is a, an extremely important part, Mr. Chairman, especially the perceptions that have come up in these hearings mm -hmm. of wrongdoing. And I agree with you, just like the Commissioner does, that even the perception of wrongdoing is something that should be investigated and should be promptly. And when I came into the senior deputy commissioner job in August of 1987, one of the assurance that I gave to Commissioner Gibbs was that any kind of allegations of wrongdoing or misconduct would be referred not only to the inspection organization, as far as I am concerned, but on senior officials, grade 15s and above, that that matter would be immediately referred to the Inspector General at uh, Treasury. So I think that the uh, present and former employees that have testified have brought out some very significant points. But I can also tell you, Mr. Chairman, that over my 30 years, I know and, or I relate to every person that has testified here. I know a lot of them personally. I'm certainly familiar with their function. And I know as they speak about these concerns, they are concerns that I know you're listening to and we're listening to in IRS. In fact, I must admit, some positive memories have come back when you think of 30 years of, of uh, government service. I'd like to point out that it could be misleading to draw inferences based on a few cases, but at the same time, the detailed information available to the subcommittee should provide a valuable perspective to the subcommittee uh, it, through efforts to improve procedures and the internal controls where they're indicated. And as the commissioner said, we can do more. There's no question of that. This information indicates that during the period October 1st, 1983 to November 30th, 1987, inspection initiated 1,228 special in, in, uh, inquiry employee cases and 2,633 full conduct investigations. As the commissioner pointed out, and as I heard earlier, approximately 48% of these cases, Mr. Chairman, were initiated as a result of employee referrals. Of the 2,633 conduct uh, cases initiated, 1,871 of them were disposed of administratively, resulting in 1,368 disciplinary actions, including reprimands, suspensions, demotions, and removal. In addition, 1,139 criminal referrals. All of this is all of this in your statement. Yes, it is, Can Mr. Chairman. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, the the main point on there that there were also cases that were referred for prosecution. 
On page eight of my testimony, Mr. Chairman, I get into the role of the 4,700 employees in the Criminal Investigation Division, and I would just say to you that I echo the words that the Commissioner had to say about the organization and its accomplishment, which I read about every single day in the newspapers in this country. I would also like to uh, point out on page 10, Mr. Chairman, that the inspection organization is responsible for ensuring integrity and that there are 1,300 people involved in, it, uh, in that organization. And, Ms. and the commissioner mentioned both internal security and internal audit. In my own experience, Mr. Chairman, I have dealt with both of these organizations. I don't know how, as regional commissioner in the Mid-Atlantic region, I could have done the things that I was asked to do without the assistance of the internal audit people as well as internal security. The internal audit conducts an awful lot of independent reviews, Mr. Chairman, to ensure that our organization is meeting the programmatic, the management uh, programs that are in place. I believe the Treasury's Office of Inspector General serves to enhance the effectiveness of IRS inspection. And in the context of the subcommittee's investigation, I think it's important, Mr. Chairman, to note that whenever an allegation of misconduct is made against an IRS executive, senior deputy commissioner, that's me, is notified and the matter is referred to the inspector general for appropriate action. The commissioner got into what happens when you're running a large, independent, decentralized organization that does collect almost a trillion dollars. I think that is the most important that we have to re-examine. And I know you have some feelings about where inspection should fit into the organization. I believe, Mr. Chairman, that inspection is appropriately placed. I believe there's a system in place. It works and it needs improvement. Another initiative that is mentioned in my testimony is the inspection hotline that will provide uh, an 800 number so that employees can report uh, areas of misconduct uh, directly to the office. Most important, Mr. Chairman, the Commissioner did indicate that he is requesting the Treasury Inspector General to conduct ongoing quality re reviews of the program activities. I'm not going to go into a lot of details as far as the management of IRS, Mr. Chairman, other than to tell you that there could be many comments made about the things that are going on and the controls that are there. And I mentioned the fact that I've been with it in many different capacities for 30 years and my feeling very strongly in my testimony and from you is that it is a well-managed agency. I think, Mr. Chairman, that the amount of challenges have already been pointed out by you in your discussions, and I think we should ensure that the IRS meets these challenges and use the 300 dedicated executives in the organization to help do that. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to also point out that based on my knowledge of the 300 executives as an executive team in IRS, I would put their integrity, their approach to their job up against any institution and any body and any corporation. And I think the thing that is most important about it is that they've always got to be willing to improve. And I believe that's where this hearing and the actions that we're trying to take to improve ourselves is going to go through that. I could sit here and tell you about all the honors we, we've received in the quality area, but I'd rather just say to you, Mr. Chairman, that we truly are committed to providing quality customer service to the people we serve. And if we don't have their confidence, and that is done through the integrity of this organization, it will be very difficult to do that. I think we can meet that challenge. I feel confident with the leadership of Mr. Goldberg, got a problem because I got both of my bosses on either side of me here, Mr. Commissioner, and the prior leadership of, of Mr. Larry Gibbs, that we can move along. And one of the key items in here is the ethics initiative, which I believe really it goes right at the hearings that you're having here. Mr. Chairman, these are examples that are indicative of IRS's ability to administer the system. And in conjunction with Commissioner Goldberg, I'll see that the IRS continues on this course and also searches out new ways to do it. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to thank you because what I've seen in the hearings and watching it the last few days, I can tell you that you permitted me to have an overall review of the amount of time that I've spent in this organization. 
I've got three pictures on my wall in my office, actually four. One from the Commissioner Gibbs giving me the highest award he can give. One from Secretary Brady giving me a presidential rank award. One from Secretary Baker giving me the presidential rank award. And last but not least, one from President Reagan giving me that. I'm proud of that, but I'm committed to make it better. And I thank you for giving me an opportunity to testify this morning. Mr. Murphy, I am just amazed. You are one of the most loquacious fellows I've ever known. I cannot believe that you would come before this committee today and gloss over, as you so have eloquently done, 12 months of investigation. I just can't imagine that. Your, your testimony has been fine, but it's been something that we admitted the first day of this hearing. We stated in the first day of this hearing that we had confidence in the majority of the members of, of the IRS, of the employees. We said that they were conscientious and dedicated. All you have done is repeat everything we have said. And at the same time, depict that career attitude of the IRS that we can do no wrong. Mr. Mr. Murphy, I am just astounded that you would come to this committee with this report and completely ignore what has been said in the last three days. Now, let me tell you, you're not dealing with no ignoramuses on this committee. You're not dealing with people who are not as just as expert as your investigators, and that is the investigators who've looked into this case. We did not go into this situation adversarially. We went in there very adequately, open-minded. Mr. Gibbs will tell you, before an announcement was made to the press that this investigation was going to be heard, what did I do, Mr. Gibbs? Didn't I bring you and Mr. Sloan in and go over the full details of what we were trying to do? Now, let me just say, I just, it's hard for me to sit here and listen to that to you, Mr. Murphy, because of the fact is that you have just completely glossed over. You would make me think that the IRS world that you describe, where wrongdoers are systematically punished and where whistleblowers applauded, is a world I don't recognize, not from our investigations. It's like the land of Oz, and you are the wizards. It's not a real world that you describe today. The real world is where employees throughout your agency are afraid to come forward to report wrongdoing or to cooperate in investigations of their superiors because of fear of retaliation. The, fear, the real world of IRS is where if, if you are not a team player, you're off the team. Now, I do not agree with your characterization of the IRS in one bit, and it worries me that you believe what you believe or say that you believe. Mr. Chairman, can I say something? Yes, you may. Mr. Chairman, I came here prepared to answer whatever questions We've you and the some subcommittee real have. For you to answer to. Okay, I, and, that, and I, I will respond to those. But also, Mr. Chairman, I also came here thinking that when we did meet on June 30th, and I would like to add that I was with Commissioner Gibbs on June 30th when you talked to us about this and committed to you, along with Mr. Gibbs, that we would work with the committee. And I met with you several times since then. I haven't changed in that feeling. And I apologize to you if, if you think that I am just glossing over wrongdoing. I do not feel that way, Mr. Chairman, but I do appreciate you giving me an opportunity to express to you my true feeling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your true feelings haven't changed since the whole, uh, whole attitude of this investigation. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of communication during the first part of this hearing. Finally, it just amounted to nothing because it just didn't, uh, I mean, it just, uh, as we will bring out in this investigation, that we did not get the cooperation that we were promised. Uh, and uh, many, many times, 6103 was that moat that was there to hide information from us as opposed uh, to permitting us to get to the actual wrongdoing, which did not involve taxpayers' information. I didn't mean to interrupt the hearing gentleman at this point to express myself like I did, but I just absolutely couldn't sit here and listen to this without responding. So without, unless there's further comment, I will now turn it over to Mr. Gibbs. Chairman. With attention in the room, I think I will 
say something that uh, I mentioned over a year ago when I was addressing the staff, my staff of the Internal Revenue Service. I remarked that Groucho Marx once said to his hostess as he was leaving a dinner party, Madam, I've had a wonderful evening, but this isn't it. Um, let me say that the last year and the last, particularly the last three days, have been very, very difficult. I go back to a year ago, Mr. Chairman, when you and I, Mr. Murphy, and I believe Mr. Sloan, sat down together and we talked about this investigation. I'm not going to go through my written statement. The written statement is there, but I'd like to talk more specifically about what has been done within the Internal Revenue Service in the last year to try to address some of the issues that you've been investigating the last year and that have been covered in the last two and a half days of testimony. You recall that the same week that we had our discussion, we went on national television, and on national television, I said that I thought the allegations were very serious, that I look forward to working with you so that we could have a full, fair, an open discussion of the issue. I mentioned the commissioner staff meeting, which was held about a week after that. Commissioner staff, Mr. Chairman, is made up of the top executives within the national office, people who are the leaders in the national office of the Internal Revenue Service. I felt it was important to bring them up to date on our discussions, what the organization was attempting to do in terms of responding to the requests that we were going to get for information. And I indicated at the staff meeting that I felt there were two major challenges here. One was finding a way to get the results of the investigation out to the public along with whatever allegations were there. The second, I indicated that I thought that internal communications within the organization during this period of time would be extremely important. I expressed the opinion that our employees would have to understand that we as leaders were taking the investigation seriously. They would also have to understand that we were cooperating because we wanted to get the facts out. I specifically stated that anyone with information should be encouraged to bring it forward just as we did to encourage employees to take threats to our integrity with utmost concern. I asked the people in the staff meeting to take this message down within their organization. In late July, I asked that all of the executives of the Internal Revenue Service in the field, the regional commissioners, the regional inspectors, the assistant commissioners and others come in to the national office for a one-day meeting. Here we again briefed people, all of the top executives of the Internal Revenue Service, about what the situation was. I expressed the feeling at that time that we must take the allegations as serious and important. I express the need to support a full and fair investigation and urge that the facts be shared with the public. Again, I encouraged any employee who had relevant information with respect to the allegations to make it available. I specifically ask each of the individuals to open channels of communication to take seriously my request that there be a full discussion of the matters within the organization and that we not react defensively, but rather take this as an opportunity to recognize that with respect to whatever shortcomings, whatever issues, 
whatever allegations were made and proved, that we needed to react in a constructive manner as an organization. I also indicated in that meeting that we were working with a team of officials in the national office to attempt to identify and address in a meaningful way the issues that would come out of the investigation. I ask that the executives who were involved on an ongoing basis to work together and to come up with a list of issues as a result of the investigation that the organization needed to address. And I'd like to just take you through some of the issues to give you a flavor. These basically came back to me at my request from management that was involved. These are the issues. Over what period of time? This, this, is, this is in late August of last year. These are some of the issues, and the idea was to begin to identify the issues, and then as other issues occurred. These were what were developed between uh, June 30th and? And late August. And late August. That's right. correct. First question that we felt should be addressed to the organization, can inspection effectively, objectively, and with autonomy police IRS, and in particular, investigate infractions by other inspection personnel or by fellow investigators in the criminal investigation function? When and how should Treasury Inspector General be involved in issues originating within inspection? Do the procedures governing the initiation and closing of criminal investigation cases, both administrative, grand jury, and others, contain sufficient safeguards to prevent manipulation of the process for private purposes? Is the audit trail of action sufficient to ensure a complete record in all cases? Third. Should certain classes of employees be held to higher standards of conduct than others, such as employees of internal security and criminal investigation, managers, and executives in general? Four, what level of autonomy should executives have in regard to integrity decisions? Are the guidelines appropriate regarding the extent of oversight exercised by executives over subordinate executives who have approval authority for their own travel leave, travel vouchers, training, and similar matters? are adequate safeguards built into these guidelines. Do the current policies, this is the fifth, do the current policies and guidelines governing assistance be given to outside groups, provide for proper interaction with the public without compromising or appearing to compromise the objective, objectivity of public trust? Six, can the service, what can the service do to establish employee trust and confidence in the integrity process? How can the service reinforce positive employee management behavior and eliminate improper or perceived actions which undermine the confidence and trust in the integrity process? There are several other pages of these items. These were items that I felt and that the management, the, the executives of the Internal Revenue Service felt needed to be addressed. From that, we assigned these issues back to a group that was headed by the Assistant Commissioner for Planning, Finance, and Research, and the Assistant Commissioner for Human Resources, Management, and Support. These are people that are at the top levels of the organization. They came back in late November with a proposal that would take these issues and roughly break them into about six categories. First, ethical conduct. Are we providing enough guidance to our employees? Second, and integ the, our integrity program. Do our employees really consider the program viable? Third, with respect to our standards of conduct, should senior level officials be held to higher standards? Fourth, the oversight of senior officials. Is it sufficient? Getting into the disciplinary action process, is it really fair? And sixth, the agency grievance procedure, is it impartial and effective? There were evaluations with respect to each of these, and there were suggestions made as to what the organization should do. For example, one of the suggestions that was made was that instead of top-level management determining whether these were problems, surveys ought to be conducted with respect to the employees of the Internal Revenue Service to see what their attitudes were in these areas. This in turn led, finally in January, to an establishment of what we call an initiative. Initiative in, our la in, in the language of the Internal Revenue Service is a major program that has top-level support and that will involve 
the commitment of the entire organization. It is something that is developed and then is discussed with what we referred to as our board of directors, the top regional commissioners, assistant commissioners, the top executives, the top 30 executives in the agency. This proposal was that the Internal Revenue Service should conduct a comprehensive review of its programs designed to integrate employee awareness uh, with the mission statement of the Internal Revenue Service and the principles, judgment, and standards that were necessary to fulfill that mission. Mr. Gibbs, let me ask you a question at this point. Um, can I, inter do I, can I, can I, do I see in what you're saying this action that was taken, this, this, this questionnaire that was brought about, and then these, uh, was this something that had already been in the minds of the IRS before we announced these uh, investigations? Chairman, let me go back for a second in answering that. Within six months after I arrived, I began a project which was designed to look at the ethical considerations. And you came on board at what time? I came on board in August of 1986. 1986. Correct. Good. That is correct. And within six months, I had basically begun a project to take a hard look at the ethics of the organization, the standards and conduct of conduct and so forth. Many of these ideas were things that were evolving out of that. Uh, but let me also say that as a result of this investigation and as a result of identifying issues as the investigation took place, we were able to add other issues to this list. And they show up in the initiative that the organization in January brought to me. Mr. Murphy actually signed the initiative. And then what we, what we did, Mr. That's Chairman. January of 19... January of 1989, okay. pardon me. Right. January of this yeah. year. We have referred to that several times. As a result of that, we began with respect to, and by the way, the, the initiative has very specific things that are proposed. One of the things, for example, that was proposed was that we bring someone outside the Internal Revenue Service that was involved, had been involved, had background and experience of how you make major changes within an organization that relate to the various items that I covered. And in addition to that, there is actually a timeline action plan with dates, things to be accomplished, that type of thing that are spelled out in the initiative. In addition to this particular initiative, there is another with respect to enhancing the integrity awareness and training, and they will be coordinated with this. That one will be coordinated with this one. At the same time this was being done, we also asked that inspection and the criminal investigation division take, again, a look of issues that were coming out of your investigation and attempt to identify issues and then come up with concrete actions that could be taken to actually address issues that were being raised. My point to you is this. I realized last night, quite honestly, as we were, as I was preparing for this hearing, that you'd heard generalization. At least in my paper, I referred to these initiatives, but I'd never taken the time to sit down and tell the committee to go through what, what had been done in terms of some detail about the Internal Revenue Service attempting to address the issues that were raised during the course of the investigation and the issues that had been squarely placed on the table over the last two and a half days. Having said that, I will say to you, and I recognize that this is some place where we may differ in terms of an opinion and approach. I honestly believe that this kind of an approach that we've gone through, the Internal Revenue Service has gone through over the last year in terms of taking a hard and painful look at itself, coming forward with outside help, and I don't mean just the outside help in the initiative, I mean the help of the committee and others that are going to be involved in these issues with the Internal Revenue Service. I frankly think that's the proper approach to take to these issues. And I would urge, personally, that this approach be taken in lieu of an approach to expand 6103 and to move 
the inspection service out of the Internal Revenue Service and through to Treasury. And I will tell you why. I recognize that the issues that we are dealing with over the course of the last year and the last two and a half days are very serious issues. I also recognize that the issues that 6103 and the original organization of inspection within the Internal Revenue Service as a non-political, all-career employee organization, the issues that those two things are attempting to address are very, very important. Namely, the concern that the Internal Revenue Service not be a, have the appearance for abuse or actual abuse in terms of outside influence, of political influence. This, in effect, was the thrust of the Truman scandals in 1940 and the Nixon-Watergate scandal in the 1970s. The thrust of that was that there were politicians, that there were political appointees and others that were attempting to use access to confidential tax information to influence outcome of cases and to accomplish illegitimate purposes. And I would simply urge that as we look at the issues that these hearings address, that this investigation addresses, that we not adopt an approach that will take us back to a time where these issues, these concerns about potential political influence are every bit as strong as the concerns you have about the Internal Revenue Service today. People have asked me, Larry, what's, what's different? Commissioner, what's, what's different about the Internal Revenue Service? We have, the Congress has access to, to other agencies' records. The Congress certainly has access to the Inspector Generals at other places. What's different about the Internal Revenue Service? I've said that I thought in the final analysis there were two differences. One was service, I think, is unique in terms of the number of taxpayers, the number of constituents that are affected on an ongoing daily basis and those matters affect very confidential personal and financial records, more so than any other government agency. I think the second thing that is different is that history really does demonstrate in the 40s, into the 70s, that access to that information in an arena which lends itself to either abuse or the appearance of abuse makes for difficulties in terms of the integrity of the system that I submit to you in the final analysis are every bit as important as the integrity issues that you gentlemen are dealing with today. The other thing that I would say is that having performed the task for three years, I will tell you that it is my personal opinion that the commissioner needs an inspection function, needs an internal audit and internal security function. If the responsibility for administering a large decentralized organization like the Internal Revenue Service is to be given to the commissioner, my own feeling is that the commissioner must have the authority to direct the internal audit and the internal security functions of the inspection organization in order to be effective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, gentlemen, I hate to interrupt at this point, but there is a vote on the floor, and I will recess for only five or six minutes, just as quick as it takes to get over and get back. Subcommittee will come to order. <coughs> we will probably move from this point on, and ask probably very few questions about the matters of your testimony, primarily which we mostly agree. I mean, uh, as I have stated time and time again, you know, we recognize the majority of IRS employees, loyal, dedicated, conscientious, uh, but there are a few instances uh, that uh, we feel like need some attention. So I think that probably, at least my questions, Mr. Hassett, will primarily be uh, on some of the uh, uh, 
developments that have come to pass the last several days. Mr. Goldberg, within the last week, the National Office issued bulletin number one, an office of disclosure alert, warning IRS employees about unauthorized disclosures and referencing two criminal actions against two against current or former IRS employees who violated disclosure requirements. Can you tell us who proposed this bulletin, whether you personally approved it, what its purpose is, and whether you believe it may have created at least the appearance that National Headquarters doesn't want employees to report instances of wrongdoing to this committee, to this subcommittee? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I was not acquainted till that, with that bullet until it was brought to my attention yesterday. Uh, I do know that this is a project that has been in the works, I believe, for about 18 months. The Internal Revenue Service takes very seriously its disclosure responsibilities under 6103. I question the timing. I share your questions. You question what, sir? The, the timing of that release. I, 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 I certainly sure as heck hope it wasn't released for that purpose. Who uh, released it? I, Mr. Chairman, I don't have an answer to that question. Mr. Chairman, it, it was released through the uh, Disclosure Operations Division, which reports within the Assistant Commissioner of Examination in the National Office. And it's an alert that, that is limited did to you, National you, Office employees. And did I, did you, not, did, I didn't know about it until you yesterday. You didn't approve it? No, I didn't, sir. Well, who approved it? I mean, who actually authorized it? Mr. Kern, do you know? This is strange. All of a sudden, we get document 7454, July-89, two days before our hearings take place. And you know that there were present employees of IRS testifying. Now, what are we supposed to suspect from that? As I said, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I, I question the timing. My, I, I, I don't believe it was with malice of forethought. I sure as hell hope it wasn't. I said at the outset of my statement, and I mean it, I am giving <coughs> publicly my personal and deep thanks to each IRS employee who has come forward and testified before this committee. Well, let me say this. We have every confidence in you, and I want you to know that. We're not, you know, <laughs> trying to put you on the spit before you even take office. Uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand, I think some questions need to be answered. For the record, I'd like to know uh, who developed this memorandum, who authorized it, and uh, how, it was dis how it was dispersed. Because I think, again, Mr. Murphy, the wrong connotation to develop from this, the, from this information, contrary to, you know, to your testimony. Mr. Chairman, we will submit for the record a detailed chronology. As you know, there have been very serious and very troublesome allegations in a very different context about wrongful disclosure by IRS employees. And that is a very serious problem. Mr. Goldberg, we've heard some disturbing testimony the last three days about the conduct of a number of present uh, IRS employees. Several witnesses tes yesterday testified under oath that a number of group managers in Los Angeles CID monitored and attempted to control the testimony of CID agents with respect to the inspection investigation in California. We heard about threats involving the son of a CID group manager if negative information on Mr. Saranoff was reported to inspection. It appears that many of the improper activities that took place in Los Angeles appeared when Mr. Connett was the district director. Mr. Connett now has a choice job as IRS Revenue Service representation representative in Paris, France. We heard testimony about senior inspectors who took up a collection for Mr. Santella. I would like to tell this subcommittee specifically, I'd like for you to tell this subcommittee specifically what you intend to do with respect to the discipline of those and other individuals who appear to be guilty of wrongdoing. M Mr. Chairman, the, the, the testimony that we have heard about matters in the Los Angeles office, <coughs> delay in the Chicago office, the, the so-called boat incident, the, the matters involving uh, allegations that were, were ostensibly provided to our inspection function in the national office and not followed up are deeply troubling. I think they are deeply troubling not just to me. I believe they're troubling to this organization. I can't give you today the precise specifics of what I, can, what I am going to do, 
but I can give you my assurance that they will receive my personal attention and they will be addressed promptly. I don't know whether Mike or uh, Teddy or, or Bruce wants to make an additional comment on that, on the questions you've, you've raised. Uh, the one question you raised about matters that come to the attention, I believe it was yesterday, <laughs> they will be properly investigated. Uh, the one specifically you're talking about a, a child of a, an employee, it's the first time I've heard of it, <coughs> and I really can't comment on it except to assure you that we are going also through the record and areas that you find that in your testimony that is causing concern and allegations that have not been shared with us before by the employees, we will properly investigate that. And the ones that require referral to the Inspector General will be referred. Um, <clears throat> let me just follow up on that question. Could any of you actually would, would tell the subcommittee specifically what your plan fear of retaliation for reporting misconduct that exists. After listening to the evidence developed by the subcommittee investigators and the testimony of the witness yesterday morning, I'm convinced that IRS internal investigation of Sarno and of the improper relationship between the CID and the inspection, inspection in Los Angeles was completely ineffective in reaching the truth of the situation. One of your chief investigators on the matter, Mr. Russell Davis, who testified here under oath, has now come to the same conclusion. Given the intimidation of witnesses and the other inference in interference in the investigation, do you have, in have confidence in the conclusions reached in the original inspection, Mr. Murphy? Or Mr. Kern, either one. Yes, sir. Uh, you're speaking to questions of the, as I understand it, of the concern among special agents in the Los Angeles district that they could not properly come to inspection and Mr. Davis's statements which I believe was along the line that he felt that people were reluctant to talk to him during his investigation. Is that correct? Right. Uh, a lot of things happened in the Los Angeles investigation that I can't talk about. The allegations, one, was that the manager in Los Angeles had a relationship with certain of the criminal investigation people that made it undesirable for people to come forward and that many of them had their concerns. This was investigated. This was investigated twice. The people that, some of the people that testified to you and some of the people in the district that have made statements and were referred to us, we went to them, we interviewed them, we got statements from them. The problem we encountered is while everybody knew rumors, nobody knew facts. And some people who were talked as if they had significant facts that they could share with us, when we asked them, they did not have facts. They had rumors. They saw somebody going to lunch. They saw somebody going to uh, dinners with other people in crowds. The manager that you're talking about in Los Angeles had responsibility for the inspection division in that district. That was that individual's responsibility. So there would be a relationship. We would hope it would be a relationship that would be a professional but detached relationship because nobody, I don't think, feels comfortable in going to strangers to report things, generally. So we try to develop a knowledge among the people in the district of the inspectors that there. It happens that this manager happens to be the first field manager who was female in the inspection service. I know what her feeling on this is, that if she had been a male going to lunch with these same people, nobody would have questioned that. And so there are certain feelings on her part, and it's shared by a number of other people, that the first female manager was going to go through the, the test and torture of fire and proving herself. We looked into every allegation we had on that. We found nobody with specific information that would allow us to draw any conclusion whatsoever that that manager was sharing anything inappropriately with the chief of the division in that district. I don't really think you got the gist of my question. M Mr. Chairman, maybe I could help on the first part of your question, if you like. Okay. Uh, you asked what we are doing about what appears to be a, I guess you said, no question of a pervasive uh, fear of repri reprisal and retaliation, and I would just like to 
uh, point out that the item that uh, Mr. Gibbs brought out that was started on the strategic initiative calls for action in that very area to get at the employee issues and concerns about what is, how do you feel when you turn somebody in and how should the organization react to you? And this is going to be done through interviewing people in the field and having them report back and then building in training programs that can deal directly with that. And I'm trying to come at the broader issue that you raised, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, Mr. Kern, the testimony that we received was that the investigation, your investigation, was inadequate mainly because of the threats of intimidation and the fact that people would not come forth and be forthwith uh, in, the, in, in their testimony. That's, that's the problem that, 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 we, uh, that, that troubles me at this time. Yes, sir, and I can see from the testimony you received where you would be concerned. But we run in into organizations, all kinds of problems. In district offices, you're talking about uh, the formal groups, the informal groups, who's in and who's out which is a normal thing that happens, I guess, in most industries, uh, private industry, and it also happens in government. Uh, when we have tried to, every time we have received allegations of that, we have tried to determine what is the source of employees being afraid to testify. And when you cannot identify something as an investigation, the rumors run you literally crazy. You have to have something to investigate, which I'm sure your investigators will tell you. And many times you feel there's something there, but you can't get to it. Well, it looked like to me that the intimidation that was uh, alluded to yesterday or testified mm -hmm. as to was yeah. pretty specific. And uh, Mr. Goldberg, I have uh, two other matters that I'd just like to ask you a question about. One is that the Los Angeles tax amnesty program for tax evaders with legal source income that Mr. Sarno put in place the other is the destruction, the destruction of documents by your present special agent in New York, Mr. Levy. You have already advised the subcommittee that the National Office was never consulted or requested to approve the Saranoa Tratna Connet Limited Amnesty Program for tax invaders who are Tratna's clients. Has IRS canceled this program now that it has come to your attention? Uh, no, it hasn't, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Again, as I understand it, in the first place, to set the record straight, it is not an amnesty program in the sense that those involved are not given amnesty, they're given no promise of no prosecution, and they're given no promise of no investigation. <clears throat> Having said that, I'll tell you, when I first heard this thing, I kind of, I don't, I, I've never I don't practiced. I think that you've looked into the arrangement well, very closely. It is an amnesty program. Mr. In other words, if you make the deposit in a safe deposit box, then you will have made payment which then is an invasion, uh, which is a, an escape clause as far as the law is concerned. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, uh, Milburn to answer that, but let me say this. I, you know, this, they described this thing to me, and I'm a, I do civil tax, and I kind of, I looked up at it. I didn't understand what they were talking about. Well, Mr. Murphy, but they, let me tell you, yeah. their response was this. Mr. Commissioner, should we send that money back? Should we say, we don't want your money? <laughs> It's a tough question. The answer is, it's on my table. I'm going to look at it. And I think part of our management process is we need to, to address these was policy not, considerations. But this was not an IRS policy. It was not an IRS practice. It, was, had, it had not been condoned by IRS, if I, as I understand it. Bruce? No, sir. Um, we responded back to the attorney who made this arrangement that we could not give him any assurances. What he wanted, apparently, was uh, a pass on prosecution for his client. Um, and we responded back to him that that couldn't be done. Now this was done through the district director's office and through counsel's office. Um, with the relationship between the attorney and the chief criminal investigation division, of course it smacks of uh, impropriety uh, at this time. We do plan to take a look at that, but I do want to reiterate what Mr. Uh, Goldberg said. Looking at it from hindsight, uh, not being aware of it at the time, I can imagine the district was in the position of, what do we do? Not take this money. Mr. Chairman, I assure you that we will have a service-wide policy on those types of arrangements in the very near future. Mr. Milburn, did, uh, you didn't know the close relationship between Mr. Saranoff and Mr. Tr Tratna? No, sir. 
Mr. Chairman, I think it would be useful for, for uh, the Assistant Commissioner to clarify where he was in the organization at various times. You weren't the, were you the Assistant Commissioner at, at during the relevant period? Mm -hmm. Well, the question I have, and maybe you can answer it, Mr. Murphy or Mr. Gibbs. Uh, this particular tax amnesty program went on for 10 years without the IRS National Office knowing about it. What does this tell you about the National Office control over its 63 district offices, seven regional offices, and 10 service centers? Mr. Chairman, I really would like to chat with you and the committee about, subcommittee about this. Are you aware of the IRS voluntary disclosure program in the criminal area? Are you gentlemen aware of it? It's not voluntary, though, is it? It certainly is. It absolutely it, is. Let me explain it. And this comes uh, to a large extent from my experience as a practitioner. If someone has not filed a tax return knowingly, willfully, that is a crime. The service after World War II had a formal policy, actually a written policy, where if you met certain standards, you could come in, file the return, pay the tax, and you would not be prosecuted criminally. There was a great deal of criticism about that formal policy, and it was terminated. After that policy was terminated, when a, an attorney had a client who had willfully failed to file a return, and the client came in and told the attorney that. The question was, since the service no longer has this policy, how does the person get back into the stream without being prosecuted? Is there a way to do that? And as I was beginning my practice, it was customary, and I have some cases if you'd care to have the citations, where the attorney would come into the Internal Revenue Service and indicate that there was a client that had not paid the return that the client was concerned that if the client made their identity available, they would be subject to prosecution, and that the attorney wished to tender the amount of the tax without identifying the client. My understanding is, and I think this is documented through criminal uh, defense texts, tax texts, and so forth, that this and similar types of activities have been done for a long time throughout the service in a variety of different ways. Now, frankly, over a period of time, the service has developed an informal. It's not formalized, it's not written down, but there are informal guidelines, and they're well known, of how you can come in to the Internal Revenue Service and make a disclosure and identify a client, and you, the service will agree not to prosecute the client if the client, if the taxpayer pays the amount of tax, interest, and penalty. What I'm simply suggesting is that with respect to this particular type of arrangement, I do not see that it is, it's different. I have not seen one with a safety deposit box key and that type of thing, but what was deposited in the safety deposit box was the return. The cash was tendered to the service. And the t attorney, in effect, as I read the materials, and the first time I saw this was from your materials, let me, at the beginning. You, let me read you something in regards to that because I think it would clarify it a little bit. Right. <clears throat> this is a letter addressed to me on July the 7th of 1989 from Mrs. Gail Morin. And it, the question was, does the IRS consider the arrangement with Mr. Tratner to be a form of voluntary disclosure? What procedures or case law exist to define handling of voluntary disclosure cases? And she writes back. The IRS would not consider Mr. Tratner's letter as constituting any sort of voluntary disclosure, nor does IRS's response treat it as such since, among other reasons, the Tratner letters did not identify the taxpayers. At best, Mr. Tratner would have a defense argument, that is, his client paid, which could be asserted if his client were later subject to criminal prosecution. According, it is unlikely that such an argument would either impact on the IRS decision to proceed with an investigation, or two, its decisions to recommend criminal prosecution to the Department of Justice if such a recommendation were otherwise supported by the facts. However, it might have an effect on the willingness of the Department of Justice to prosecute 
since it could be more difficult to get a conviction if the full tax were paid. So uh, I think that pretty well... Uh, Can I finish my explanation? Sure, go right ahead. Because my point is, this is not a voluntary disclosure, gentlemen. It was this is not, it is not a... Gentlemen, the letter back from the district director, dated October 17, 1985, says, therefore, the filing of your client's returns in the safety deposit box does not constitute a legal finding. And my understanding from reading now, if you have, if what you're suggesting is that the district office was telling this taxpayer, we will not prosecute. I thought you said originally that it was a voluntary disclosure. No, sir. What I was trying to do is explain the evolution of the voluntary disclosure policy to say that it has now evolved to the point where there are procedures where you can come in and identify your client and go through the voluntary disclosure procedure. That's not what yeah. this is. Yeah. Well, Mr. My, yeah. Mr. And, Miller, and I you, don't see any implication that says it is. Are you going to expand this to other yes, districts? Yes, sir, if I may. Um, are you going to ex extend yes, this sir, to other districts? Oh, no, question, sir. Mr. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you said, am I going to explain this? <laughs> no, I think we've had a pretty good ex explanation. Dear, Mr. I just Chairman. like to say in Ms. Martin's letter further, the voluntary disclosure concept does not appear in the Internal Revenue Code. Same time, Mr. Trapner began submitting his letters to voluntary disclosure <laughs> A concept did appear as part of ours as policy statement P92. It should be noted that certain policy statements have been removed from the Internal Revenue Manual and that P92 was among those removed. Why was that removed, Mr. To streamline the manual and bring that into the criminal investigation section of the manual. Mr. Could Chairman, I add it, is, it is clear that this is one of many areas <clears throat> where you have called to our attention a matter that we need to deal with. With all due respect, the commissioner will make the decision, not the assistant commissioner, but, about expanding this program but Mr. or killing it. Do you have any feel that why this went on with that, for 10 years without it ever coming to light until we brought it to light? And you know how we... I, I, wait, wait. Okay. Peace. <laughs> yeah. Ten Mr. Years. Chairman, my sense is that, as I understand it from, from people who practice in the criminal tax area, that this type of arrangement that is a step removed from voluntary disclosure. You take my money, I won't file a return, but I, as, a, as a criminal defense lawyer, I believe that's going to better help me protect my client if you catch him. And I understand that if you catch him, you will criminally prosecute him, is, is, has evolved. Now, that may or may not be good tax administration, but that is, it is not, I don't believe it is limited to the Los Angeles. I think the problem in Los Angeles is the relationships or the alleged relationships among the parties that That's it's right. not it's not really this policy this is a hard call but here we are but with you're the, dealing the, with LA the most, and relationships. the most feared man in the IRS and the Los Angeles office is a man that came up with this scheme Mr. Saranoff and today Mr. Tratner represents him well I, I want to move on I'm taking up the time of my unf just want one, more, one more question and I'll come back <clears throat> Mr. Levy, I want to talk to you about the, I mean, Mr. Go, uh, Gober, I want to talk to you about the destruction of records. The subcommittee learned of the destruction of documents pertaining to the Jordache matter on June 21st. When did the IRS first learn uh, that Mr. Levy destroyed those documents? Um, Mr. Cately, do you have um, Mr. Bill, the microphone, please. Now, don't come along with that one of these broad <laughs> excuses under 6103 now, Mr. Lightning. No, Knightley. I'm pleased to say I'm going to respond on the merits. How's that for a surprise? Good. That's a shock. <laughs> I'll have a glass of water. <laughs> let, me understand, let me explain how we arrived at finding out that the documents were not available. In connection with our search uh, for records that the, uh, your committee investigators have requested, We've conducted uh, a search for thousands of documents. As you're aware, we provided al almost 30,000 total. Uh, we've done search memos out to the field and asked them to produce documents to be brought in. In middle of late May, between the 22nd and the 31st of May of this year, 1989, uh, we became aware that uh, the original, the documents that you were looking for, uh, the kind of originating documents in, in the investigations, uh, weren't, weren't no longer available. Uh, when we determined that, as I say, we're talking about the end of May, we uh, went to New York, we talked to Mr. Levy, uh, we you know, discussed it with them. We were also at the same time talking to the Department of Justice about the release of documents concerning a, a criminal case. And uh, essentially, 
And I guess about the 15th of June, we said to Mr. Levy, if we don't have the documents, we'll need an explanation to give to the committee as to what's happened to the documents. Uh, Mr. Levy, as you're aware, uh, and I'm, we made a copy of Mr. Levy's statement available, indicated that he had, in what he viewed as the ordinary course, uh, destroyed duplicate documents, some irrelevant documents, and said the documents are no longer available. To the extent they were turned over to the grand jury, he could no longer identify those. So essentially, that's the scenario of when we uh, when we knew about it, I believe we notified on June 21st, uh, Mr. Barish uh, and I guess Gail Moran and myself notified uh, Mr. Barish about the uh, problem with the documents. Do you know what, what had, do you know what would have been involved in order to have uh, destroyed duplications? It would have taken months for him to have matched one paper with another one. I mean months. Well, for him to corroborate the fact that he destroyed duplications. One statement also, just, I mean, I understand that point, and, and, but duplications, in addition, was that some of the documents were not relevant to the investigation he was doing. Well, so now, I, think, going to I, I will be candid, Mr. Chairman. I think the area needs further factual inquiry, and, and I, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying here's the, here's the record as we have found it, when we found the record the way it was, and I think we tried to promptly notify you as soon as we were aware of the problem. Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me ask a follow-up question, Mr. Goldberg. As I understand the procedure between the Treasury, the IG, the IRS, the IRS is required to report wrongdoing to the IG when that wrongdoing is by a senior manager or when the wrongdoing involves a case of national significance or a sensitive case. Has IRS reported Mr. Levy's destruction of documents in the Jordache case to the Treasury IG for investigation. Excuse me a minute. Pass the microphone. Mr. Chairman, I am not sure we have whether we have or not. My investigative branch has the allegation right now, and I don't know if they've talked to the Inspector General. We brief the Inspector General on a basis of about every two or three weeks, and when a sensitive case like this comes up, it's normal to call them to alert it. I, I can't add, really answer your question on it specifically. Would you mind trying to determine that? Uh, yes, sir, I'd be glad to. Don't you have a lot of folks in here? At least I've seen them all week. Uh, could you yeah. dispatch one of them to your office and find out whether or not that's been done or use yes, the telephone? Sir. However, I, I think the allegations, uh, the, the allegations against, if it's against Mr. Levy, Mr. Levy is not one of the people in the category that we normally refer the case to the Inspector General. However, because of the sensitivity of the matter, it is one that we should. Yeah. Well, I would like to, uh, I'd like for you to follow that up and report back to the committee uh, what you all plan to do as far as that's concerned. Uh, I have some other questions, but I would, uh, uh, Mr. Hassert. Well, thank you, Chairman. I think you already burned some of my coal, Mr. Chairman, but anyway, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to ask some questions. And I want to, first of all, say to Mr. Goldberg, uh, I think you're coming on board at an opportune time, really an opportune time. You got a, a new scrub brush and a fresh pail of water, and, and you can make some changes and some, make some changes that are important for the, for the <clears throat> uh, service, I, I believe. And, and I want to premise whatever I say here is that, you know, I think, and I told you, Mr. Murphy, uh, six or eight months ago on another issue, that I believe that the integrity and the perception of integrity are the utmost important in this country because you have a volunteer uh, group of citizens who prepare their tax returns and uh, Lord hope, hope help us that uh, we don't have to do too many audits and we can trust the integrity of the people. But in order to trust the integrity of the people, you have to have the utmost perception of integrity in the IRS. And I think probably that's part of the, the genesis of the problem. And when things started to happen, all of a sudden we put a lid on things to say, well, there's no problem here, and we're not. We're going to look the other way, and and we can keep that smoke under the lid and long enough that maybe it'll go away too. But I, I think that's what we what we see here, and, and I go along. You know, I, I think the the people that we've had testify, in my experience with the IRS, is you know there's cadres upon cadres of good, hardworking, honest, uh, diligent people that make up the IRS. But when we started to peel the skin away on the onion, all of a sudden there was a layer there that no matter how you looked at it, there was a collegiality, maybe because these people worked together for 15 years. Uh, there was a uh, 
combination of, of, of situations where people, no matter whether you're in Cleveland or in Chicago or, or uh, New York or uh, Atlanta or Texas or uh, Los Angeles, they knew the system, the network was there. Uh, they, t you know, and one one guy gets uh, uh, slapped on the wrist, and you know everybody takes up a collection to help him. I mean that system was there, and I think maybe we ought to peel down that onion to then take a real look at that layer. And, and uh, you know we've been pretty thorough, I think, and I've come into this thing kind of kind of the tail end of of, of the in inquiry here, but. Um, Murphy, you thought I was going to say Inquisition, didn't you? But I didn't. <laughs> but it was the tail end of the inquiry. But what I see is, yeah, there's a layer, there's a problem. And I think certainly we can, uh, when you got a problem and you lay it open to exposure, uh, maybe the sunshine heals, and we certainly hope and, and you have free reign to do it. And I, and I think uh, you, you understand the dimension of, of the problem here and what we have to do and restore uh, whatever integrity perception is not there. And I, and I think another look at perception, and you know, from whether you look from the top down, which many of you gentlemen have done, or you're looking from the bottom up. And when we hear your rank and file people come in here and say, gosh, you know, we try to do this, but all of a sudden we were in Chicago, we were, uh, you know, put someplace else or transferred to Kansas City or we we're put down out of management into a, you know, another slot or in uh, California people didn't listen or our children who also worked for the IRS were uh, intimidated and even some of the things that have happened here the members of the committee and, and staff the real intimidation I'm not saying it came from the IRS but there there's intimidations that happened and, and it raises a real question so uh, uh, you've you got a big job ahead of you, and what I hear by reputation, you're the man to fill that job and, and to do the job. So we're looking forward to continuing to work with you. Enough of the commentary. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Murphy, you were in my office uh, in May and then in June, and explained to me that the reason we couldn't get the documents and to, to kind of bring me up to date, the, the documents in... Uh, <clears throat> the, the Jordash case that were uh, sequestered up in New York because of, because of 6103. Uh, questions were then passed on to the Justice Department, that just, and you were saying that Justice said that you couldn't pass on those things uh, because of 6103. That was, a, I understand, because of the, the grand jury investigation, that was the holdup. And then we went to, various members went to Justice, and we got a, a, a no, uh, the word that then maybe we could get those documents. And then all then the next part in the chronolo chronology, and I guess it was the middle of June or the 21st of June, uh, lo and behold, there were no documents because they were destroyed. Did you know those documents were destroyed when you're telling us that the, the, the hang-up was the, the uh, not clearance by justice? Mr. Hastert, I had no idea of even the problem on that at that point. As Mr. Cately mentioned, there was an issue with a lot of confusion of, uh, in this of a specific request on documents. I would like to, in response to your earlier point though, so my answer to that is no, but the earlier point about 6103, uh, as we discussed uh, in the meeting with uh, you and the chairman, was it wasn't necessarily 6103 at that point, there was a question, and you, as you well point out, that there was a question of a matter under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. And the advice that I received and communicated to you was that that matter should be coordinated. I believe, Mr. Hastert, I also told you and the chairman that I, have every, I had every intention that once I had guidance as to that point, that I would provide the information, the specific information requested. And to my knowledge, Mr. Hastert, the information that re was requested uh, was sent over to you. Why would a, 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 an agent, the level of Mr. Levy, and I understand it's not, wasn't, was he in management position at all? Uh, why would he take it upon himself, or who would give him the order to go ahead and, and destroy those documents? 
Mr. Hastert, I really believe on that issue that Mr. Milburn has the information, and if not, Mr. Cately. I do not have the specifics on that, sir. Milburn? I know this has been a very confusing area, and I know that this committee, according to committee testimony, has referred this matter to the Department of Justice, Public Integrity. And I think we need to let that, that play through. However, I would like to bring to the committee's attention that I think there has been possibly a mistake in this area. And I make reference to one of the exhibits attached to the subcommittee testimony that was read in on the first day. The June 21, 1989 memorandum of uh, taped telephone interview with Conant um, may satisfy some concerns for records that I think are being looked for. I'd like to point out that Mr. Conant was telephoned, I believe, in Paris, France, um, asked to state what took place during a meeting four years prior. He mentions that records were submitted in one case versus another. I think that switched. I think if you look in the other records, you will find the copies of the investigators' reports, affidavits, things tending to support the investigation in an area. Now, that doesn't alleviate the fact that the uh, grand jury or the um, original information uh, was destroyed. However, however, we do have a detailed system of records keeping uh, documentation in our organization. We also have a description of record that is identified as a non-record. When this is over, we need to go in and look at what he made that decision on. A non-record are uh, non-usable non duplicate copies of records. You even Mr. get Miller, down. Do you, do you understand it? Is that a fact or a personal fact or a non-record? What your no, no. Is? I said we need to go back and look. These could be considered a non-record in this case. Duplicate. All right. We have guidelines in this area. That's what we'd go in and take a look at. Um, non-records could be carbon paper. I mean, you can get real. Uh, hung up on what you keep but as a record. If you have a guideline, isn't that something that you do prospectively and not retroactively? I mean, isn't that how you look at things? I mean, before those documents would have been destroyed, wouldn't you look at the guideline first? You may already know them. I but don't know. To answer your question, yes, if you're not sure. Now, I, I have interjected a change to our manual that's in clearance now that whenever informant sourced records or photocopies of records are given to a special agent before they are destroyed, they are to uh, get group manager approval in order to protect the special agent from later allegations that may be made by the informant. Because if we've seen in this, and what we deal with day in and day out, informants can go both ways, and we know that. Mr. So Hastert, I, I, I will confess this is a, a confusing one to me. And, and it is incumbent upon us to clarify the record. We look forward and hope to have the opportunity to meet with your committee and staff to lay, lay out this situation. As I understand it, several points are clear, however. If a destruction of documents took place, it took place in 1986, not incident to this committee's uh, investigation. Second, it seems to me that there are, there are two levels of question. Mm -hmm. Did an individual special agent, in violation of our guidelines, destroy documents? The other question is, if that agent was acting within the scope of the existing guidelines, are those guidelines inadequate to preserve, preserve requisite guidelines? I do not know the answers to those questions. I, I think you can see where I'm driving yes. at. I mean, there's a lot of things you can mop up and say, Jesus, we shouldn't have done this, or let's look at mm -hmm. this. What we need to make sure that those guidelines are in place and followed, Absolutely. that we don't come through this whole gamut again sometime. And you were talking about uh, a case of some national import here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would ask that uh, Mr. Milburn, uh, certainly you're not making an, an excuse for the destruction of those documents. Absolutely not, sir. We need and to look behind it. And I would like to mention one other thing, if I may. Please. <clears throat> we have a whole series of procedures for processing a, a grand jury investigation or requesting a grand jury investigation. We do not do that in a vacuum. We attach in that report the evidence that we're relying on to initiate a grand jury investigation, coupled with the tax returns that are involved, that report would contain the information that I believe the committee is looking for. What caused the initiation of this investigation? What did we rely on? That then goes through a group manager, 
It goes through a chief criminal investigation division, a district director. It then goes to the regional office for the assistant regional commissioner's approval. Then it goes to regional council outside of the mainstream of IRS. Then it goes to the Department of Justice for a review. Then it goes to the U.S. attorney who has a secondary or another review over it. And I submit that is the most heavily approved law enforcement product that there is in the land today. All right. Uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'll yield to the you? chairman. Uh, this case. Yes, sir. This particular case has been in the has been in the news. It's been in magazines on the front page of newspapers since what November of 1987. Wouldn't Mr. Levy have known about the investigation of this subcommittee into uh, this particular instance? Well, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't most of the uh, people in IRS, with all the bulletins that have been issued, wouldn't he have known that this was an important investigation going on? Wouldn't that have alerted him on its own merits not to have destroyed the property? I Sir, mean, the I, documents. I believe the investigation was initiated prior to that, and the records in question were tossed away prior to that. Well, excuse me. Also, uh, is that a, again, that's a, is that a known fact? Yeah. Mr. Hastert. Yes, uh, sir. Bruce, you sorry. said yes, yeah. that is it? Yes. Thank you. We have started an investigation of the records and any potential destruction. <coughs> we discussed it with Mr. Connett yesterday, and he was in Belgium. And it appears that there may be confusion over what records are being discussed. It may be that the records that are being discussed may be in the committee's hands already uh, because there appears to be a misidentification and a miscommunication so uh, coming. If I may interrupt. I'm so not sure of it yet, but I, I can tell you that preliminary. We don't know if, they're, look, if they've been destroyed that's, or not. That's correct. We do not know if the records they're specifically talking about, we think, are records that, belong to an, that apply to another case other than the one that was being reviewed. I don't want to dwell and get mired down in this, and in these kind of cases, I guess, like doing my IRS forms, you can get mired down real easy. But uh, a couple other things I just want to touch, and, and what I want to do is kind of lay out some things for your benefit, Mr. Goldberg, that I think are kind of systemic here, and maybe not to go back and say why it happened or mop it up, but let's take a hint and, and try to change it so it doesn't happen again. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, uh, just for the record, uh, what were the dates that you were uh, commissioner? I was commissioner from, and I don't know the specific date, in August of 1986 until March 4, 1989. Did you have prior experience with the IRS? Yes, I did. What I was uh, from 1970, November of 1972 until January of 1976. I was with the Internal Revenue Service as what? Uh, as the deputy chief counsel of the Internal Revenue Service, the acting chief counsel of the Internal Revenue Service, that's the attorney for the commissioner. Right. And the assistant commissioner technical, a position that uh, no longer exists in the Internal Revenue Service. And then from 1976 until? 1986, I was a practitioner tax uh, partner in a firm in Dallas, Texas. And what's your position now? I am a partner in the same firm in the Washington office of the Dallas firm that I have returned to uh, at the end of March. And you? have any connection with the IRS now? You're not a retainer? No, I am not. What kind of... I, I'm a taxpayer. <laughs> taxpayer. <laughs> I think we all are. Uh, what, uh, what type of cases do you... Uh, my specialty is still in the, in the tax area. Uh, I am under certain uh, limitations in terms of the extent to which I can advise someone with respect to tax matters or make an appearance before the Internal Revenue Service. So, I, I mean, for all practice, we can tell you, we can say that you're an expert in the tax field and you've been, had a long career with the IRS really before you even became com commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Hester. Well, I'm asking, is that correct? Would you, assume, would you say that, right? I, I for, since 1963, I've right. practiced in the tax Let field. Let me ask you just some things that, that happened, and again, it's tends to be systemic and uh, we're not pinpointing and we're not going to use names here, but you're aware of the allegations and the problems in the Los Angeles office. As we, again, peeled back the skin of the onion, if you may, uh, found out that uh, in the late 1970s and then even on in the early 1980s, when 
you know, before your watch, uh, that there were uh, consortiums or partnerships of uh, people who were employees in the CID department that would uh, put together money, speculative money, and uh, buy out uh, companies and sometimes there were people who were tax uh, uh, payers who owned buildings that that uh, were under investigation or under audit. And uh, in a couple cases, those, uh, uh, and this is alleged, I mean, information that came to us, I hasn't been proven by a jury or convictions or anything on this thing, but uh, when that happens, then, uh, or at least in two cases here, uh, that uh, those individuals who sold out their interest in a building or a company uh, to a holding company that was held by uh, uh, Internal Revenue uh, Agents, CID people in this case, uh, under the leadership of the gentleman that we talked about before, uh, you know, they were written off that uh, there was no tax liability or anything, and, and the people who bought this really had some r tremendous tax shelters. Uh, in order to put something together like this, and, and let's just say for the sake of argument, this is hypothetical, okay? Uh, in order to put together a, a group of uh, IRS agents, is this, is this a standard procedure? Would this be a standard procedure? Does this happen in many uh, offices? Mr. Hastert, I, I am, I'm not aware of the facts that you're relating at all in any way. All so right. from the standpoint of... So let's say it's a hypothetical situation then. Would this be a standard, this would be a standard procedure. I mean, people would have to get permission before they joined in alliances like this or partnerships like this. Is that correct? Well, I don't, I don't know for sure. I, I, I really, I... Mr. Hester, maybe I should answer that. Yes. There is no provision that forbids employees from investing. Okay. Uh, if they were going to invest in properties of... Uh, people who were under audit by the IRS, would they have to get permission from anybody? Mr. Hastert, if they were going to have a transaction with somebody who was under audit, they would be in clear violation of our rules of conduct. We are not aware that that happened. But uh, you were not, that would be a violation, otherwise you couldn't put Absolutely. together a holding company and then invest in that holding company. If you're talking about investing and buying into something that the Internal Revenue Service has an official interest, the people I think would be in a direct conflict if they had any knowledge of that. Uh, is that an opinion or is that... No, that's fact. Fact. Mr. Well, Mr. You know, yeah. We do have a limited yeah. partnership papers, and I'd yeah. be happy to share them with you. But Mr. Uh, Hatcher, yeah. I think it's important to clarify that point. For example, every you know, virtually every one of the Fortune 500 companies is constantly under audit. I don't believe our policies would preclude people who are otherwise not involved in that examination from buying stock in a Fortune 500 company. Uh, this wasn't a Fortune right. 500 company, I, I have to tell you, and. and uh, uh, Mr. Hatcher, I'm just asking uh, on this situation, and, and that's pointing to a certain thing, but, you know, why then, what, where, was the, where was the glitch in the system that this thing didn't get reported? I mean, these guys were CID guys. I mean, these are the top investigators. How could, it's the same guy who was involved with another situation, the same guy who ended up going into a partnership with people from Cleveland and Chicago uh, when he retired. I mean, how come this thing happens over and over again? And, and, and you know, respectfully, Mr. Murphy, you say that this is, you know, just a couple things that happened, but it, it, for me, for a guy just looking in this in the first place, it was repetitive. It has happened over and over and over again. Mr. Hastert, I, I agree with you. I think any type of wrongdoing that's involved on it has got to be deal, dealt with and any patterns that do occur. I don't disagree with you on that. I'd like to make a point on something that was brought to our attention through this discussion, and then maybe Mr. Kern uh, can respond to your specific question on why why did all this happen first of all on a tax sh shelter as such uh, the the problems as you probably know we've had with tax shelters is with the abusive type tax shelters tax shelter in itself is not a, uh, a violation but there is a, a fact that came up and I think it came up in earlier testimony and that was uh, if if the facts are true using your hypothetical of a of a supervisor and a subordinate involved in the Ten same... Ten subordinates. Yeah. And how many? Ten. Okay. But the point is, even if it's one, 
even though there may not be a prohibition. I think, as the commissioner said, that is certainly an area that should be looked at. And I think and, it goes and, back and to my, your perception. My point, point. Mr. Per my, Mr. Murphy, is, is what's happened here is there tends to be a collegiality, a fraternity that develops in this thing. You know, we're in business together. I'm not going to blow the whistle on you. You're not going to blow the whistle on me. And that tends, and maybe, maybe, as Mr. Goldberg indicated before, maybe somebody has to be on the outside that somebody can go to and say, hey, I need to talk to you, and I don't want to have to talk to my bo boss or my immediate supervisor or my supervisor's boss because everybody's in bed together on this thing. And I, I think that's the implication. That's the perception. And we need to find ways to, to take that away and, and, and to, to cure that problem. Uh, Mr. Hester, yes. may I respond? The same organization that I think that you have information from, we received three or four years ago, and the matter was investigated. While it's a tax matter, I don't think I can respond to the specifics of it, but we did investigate that matter. So it wasn't something that was unknown in the organization. Several instances, same people. Well, sometimes allegations aren't necessarily accurate either. Uh, but I can guarantee you that they was investigated. Not, all, however, the same situation, different allegations at that time. Thank you. So we need to look into it to find out. Well, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not bringing this up to mop yeah. up. I, I'm just yeah. saying that it appears there's problems, and problems at that certain layer, and that's where we need to address these things and, and solve those problems. So I appreciate your uh, <clears throat> discussion here, and, and certainly. Uh, the candidates that will, I think you've shown, and Mr. Goldberg, is, again, I commend you for, congratulate you, but as I said the day you're congratulated, you've got a, a lot of work ahead of you, and, and, and good luck to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cox. I'm sorry, I, sir, cannot read your name tag. Kitely. Kately? Kately, I'm sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Cayley, I'd just like to follow up on your earlier testimony about the documents requested by this subcommittee. As I understand it, uh, when the subcommittee first requested the documents, the formal response from the service was that uh, there were no taxpayer waivers. Is that correct? Correct. At that time, did you have any idea what were the documents that were being requested? We knew what was being requested by the committee. We did not search and determine whether or not, you know, they were available since there was no authority to turn them over. We, we began it? to identify where they might be um, on the possibility that if a waiver was obtained, we'd be able to, uh, uh, you know, comply with the request. Is it the case that necessarily all of the documents that were in that universe requested would have been subject to the necessity for taxpayer waivers? No, we provided at different times different pieces of information, as I say, over a long period of time. Um, we suggested the waivers as one of the, op one of the ways to uh, 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 deal with the 6103 limitations, and we've provided you with drafts of waivers. And so, uh, and, you know, different documents at different times were edited. So it would have been possible then, at least if we had known precisely what documents we were talking about, to say that some of these documents require taxpayer waivers and others don't. Well. In terms of all the documents you've asked for, yes. In yes. connection with this investigation, yes. Some did not require them. We, we provided uh, some without any waiver at all. There was a, a narrow universe of cases which was in, involved specific identifiable taxpayers that we had to deal with. Uh, the ones that were just personnel actions uh, were Privacy Act. All right, now I'm speaking only. specifically about the documents that uh, eventually the, were... The ones you, we can't find, is it? Uh, were at one time in the custody of Mr. Levy and no longer exist. Right. Okay, if we're, uh, we're folk, yeah. In that universe of documents, is it the case that 100% of them would necessitate a taxpayer waiver yes. in order to deliver this committee? Correct, Mr. Cox. Okay. Uh, and at the time, no inquiry was made as to whether the documents existed well, we, before this committee was put to having to get taxpayer we, waivers. I would have to go back and reconstruct exactly how we did the search memos. As I say, we have done, produced, you know, thousands of pages of here, and I, I guess I could go back and reconstruct exactly when we did a search memo asking for the documents that might capture, uh, you know, the universe that we're looking at here. And, you know, I could go back and reconstruct a chronology for you. Um, what I tried to do here was give you the chronology of when we focused that they weren't, right. they weren't coming in within the universe. Uh, and there were some, when we were dealing with the Department of Justice, there were two categories of documents, not only these, 
but some administrative documents which did exist and were inspected by the committee. And yes, and no, I'm speaking so now about these. All I'm trying to say is uh, we, we were coordinating with the department. As I say, there were, we weren't coordinating over the, something that didn't exist. Let me put it that way. <laughs> All right, so step one is committee requests the documents. Step two is you can't have the documents without taxpayer waivers. Step three is the subcommittee arranges for taxpayer waivers. Right. And then what was step four? And we, we were conducting the search to try and locate them. Well, step four was you can't have the documents anyway, right? We got the taxpayer waivers, then we're told you can't have the well, documents. We, we, first, we, I mean, say we're looking for the documents. Uh, it was clear a possibility that we would have to turn them over at that point. We coordinated with the Department of Justice because of a pending uh, investigation by the department saying, look, folk, uh, department, here are some documents that have been requested by the Hill. To be candid, the prosecutors had a much more conservative view of that than their national office. And, and the, the de Department of Justice was not informed that the documents did not exist. Well, there were two categories of documents. Let me, there were the category of documents that clearly did exist, which were administrative documents. I'm talking about the Levy documents. Correct. At that point in time, we were not discussing. Justice Department had no clue that these documents had been destroyed when they responded to your inquiry about I, whether they should be turned over to this subcommittee. I. Well, did you tell them? It, it depends on when you're talking about. At some but point, you didn't know that the documents were destroyed, so you couldn't have told them, right? Well, it, it depends on the point in time when we talked to them. Well, this is at the point when we had got the taxpayer waivers. Right. Uh, and we then said, "Now send us the documents," and the service responded, "No." We said no, and as I said, that covered a certain universe of documents which did actually exist and which you later obtained uh, by way of agreement with the department and inspection uh, as opposed to copies, which we had, we had normally provided copies without just inspection. So I'm trying to distinguish between those. There were clearly documents that did exist uh, that we coordinated but, but with. Well, I've from the outset been talking about the, what I'm calling the Levy documents. Right. Those okay. do not exist. Well, correct. At least so we've been informed now by correct. the service. Well, th the question is, which documents are we talking about? That's I'm talking my, about my, the Levy documents. My earlier, That's not a my earlier testimony was that I thought the area needed further factual development because it is not clear what documents we're talking about. There is some confusion about that as to who got what documents on what date. Mr. Levy's current testimony is, has been presented to the committee saying as to what he uh, thought happened to these documents. And we'll get to that in a moment because that's different than what the service told us happened to the documents. But hang on to that for a okay. moment. Uh, so, step four, start at the outset. Right. Step one is we ask for the documents. Step right. two is you can't have the documents without right. taxpayer waivers. Step three is we get the taxpayer waivers. Step four is you can't have them because these documents relate to an ongoing criminal investigation. The, the question was we're going to talk to the Department of Justice and see if they have any objection to turning them over. Right. And, and the response came back as a result of that consultation, no, you can't have the documents because they're the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation. The, the subcommittee next uh, considered issuance of a subpoena for those documents, and I think you're aware of that, uh, as a result not, of the fact that voluntarily the service was not willing to produce those documents. The it was not the service that was refusing to turn over those documents. We said we have full legal authority to turn over those documents. The Department of Justice said this would interfere with an ongoing criminal investigation, and that's why we took that position. Well, all right, fair okay. enough, but the Justice Department, unfortunately, was not apprised that the Justice that Department nobody had even looked to see what these documents were. They presumably had some representation about what the documents were in order to reach their conclusion that they were the subject no. of an ongoing criminal investigation. I'll, I'll tell you why I'm, why I'm interested in this. Okay. Because uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats on this subcommittee were of like mind. Uh, this was not a partisan issue. Uh, we were put to the issuance of a subpoena in order to get these documents. And the only reason that, that we didn't issue a subpoena is that uh, the Justice Department uh, was willing to, uh, on uh, the uh, authority of people high up that didn't know anything about this at first, uh, intervene and say, of course you can have these documents. This is not anything that would ultimately be the subject of executive privilege. Uh, very important that the Congress get a chance to look at these documents. And at that point, uh, somebody bothered to take a look to see whether the documents even existed, and it turns out that they've been destroyed. Some um, of the documents that you were requesting. As I said, yes. there was a category of documents that you eventually did look at and did review. All right, now let me, let me characterize this. Some of, might, some of which may be in the hands the of the viewpoint department. of someone who uh, is a member of Congress <coughs> uh, serving on this committee looking into corruption in the IRS. Uh, we're taking our jobs seriously here. Uh, there are very troublesome allegations. This involves one of them. 
Uh, we've asked for documents. Uh, we're told, first, you can't get the documents because you don't have taxpayer waivers. Second, you can't get the documents because even though you got the waivers, uh, this is the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation. Uh, finally, when that hurdle is overcome, because the Justice Department waives any objection on that score, uh, we're told, well, sorry, but the documents were destroyed. Uh, you see how this looks. And if it were the case that th this were a top priority and uh, rooting out uh, bribery and corruption were uh, the number one job, uh, I don't think that this appearance would be uh, uh, what we'd be looking at. We'd, we'd see something that looked a little bit different. I'm, I'm as a result, greatly troubled by this. Uh, I, I'd like, at this point, to turn to our new commissioner and ask you how many days ago it was that uh, you were formally sworn into office. I uh, tried for July 4th, but landed on July 5th, Mr. Cox. So, uh, how, nonetheless, I am starting with a bang, I can see. Yes, yeah, so I, 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 uh, I want to welcome you here to uh, uh, your new post and, and uh, say that, that while uh, I am troubled by much of the testimony that we've heard over the last several days, that I can think of no better person in America, and I'm quite serious about this, to take on this job at this point uh, than Commissioner Goldberg. Uh, you've got uh, uh, just a, a stunning and stellar record of achievement. Uh, it's been uh, my privilege to work with Commissioner Goldberg at one time in the same law firm. He later went to a rival law firm and uh, uh, nonetheless is reputed among everyone whom he's ever met uh, as an honest and hardworking and, and brilliant uh, tax lawyer and manager. And as one who used to teach federal income tax at Harvard, I can tell you that uh, I haven't learned half as much as uh, Fred has already forgotten. Uh, so I, I, I welcome you to, to this task, but I, I must say that you're going to have to be the caped crusader uh, in order really to take this on and, and uh, uh, do what must be done. I don't think anybody that's here today uh, is responsible in any way, either through uh, uh, malfeasance or misfeasance, for what has gone on. Nonetheless, in an outfit of 120,000 people, and you think about how many people that is, if you met with one of them every day, uh, it would take you over 300 years. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of folks out there, and keeping that under control is going to be difficult. I, I was interested in your testimony that it would be uh, unwise to transfer the inspection function outside to an IG inside Treasury. We heard from a panel yesterday that uh, suggested that uh, it might be possible to maintain the necessary expertise with an IG in Treasury who was solely responsible for the IRS. And I'm also interested that uh, as an interim step, having just come on board, you've asked Treasury to uh, uh, have the Treasury IG conduct oversight of your own inspection function, which I commend you for. I, I wonder if you could Mr. comment Cox, on Mr. Cox, if I could clarify, uh, I, I hope I am crystal clear. I personally have absolutely not prejudged the question of whether some portions of inspection should be moved to the direct jur jurisdiction of the Inspector General. I am specifically and honestly agnostic on that subject. Now, we've heard from former Commissioner Gibbs, who feels very strongly that that would be a mistake. We've heard from Senior Deputy Commissioner Murphy, who also sincerely and with the interest, best interests of the system at heart believes that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. You have heard from others who feel strongly that would be the right thing to do. It will get my full and fair consideration. It will get full and fair consideration at the senior most levels of the Treasury Department. I wonder if I might ask uh, one other question of this entire panel, since there is so much assembled expertise here. Uh, we have asked several other of, of our witnesses and gotten some ideas of an answer, but not a precise answer on the legal question of what strictures are there on an IRS employee against private practice, as it were, uh, against tax preparation for uh, compensation outside of what the government is paying? Is that violative of statute? Is that violative of regulation? Is it violative of guidelines? Uh, Mr. Cox, in response to your answer, <coughs> no employee in the Internal Revenue Service is allowed or are rules of conduct to practice taxes on the outside. You can prepare tax returns for your immediate family and friends, but not for charge. And no federal employee can represent a taxpayer in front of the Internal Revenue Service. 
With respect to the former prohibition, what is the source of that prohibition? Our rules of conduct. Uh, now, how which, are those rules which, of sir, conduct adopted? Are they uh, adopted and published in the Federal Register? Yes, sir. We have a copy of it, which I'd like to put in the, the record for you all, that you can have a copy of it. We also have a letter that usually goes out from the commissioner to every new employee, stressing ethics, integrity, the rules of conduct. We do require every employee to sign for the rules of conduct, and these have been in effect and been promulgated, I would assume, since back in the 1950s. Now, would the gentleman yield on that certainly. point? Uh, on the I think that we're going to have to probably put a time limit on it. Uh, uh, so if I, why don't you uh, finish? As a matter of fact, Mr. Chairman, I've asked my last question. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'll, I'll Mr. If Martinez. I have, if I have the floor, I'll continue on that same question then. Okay. On the rules of conduct, uh, you require the employee to read and understand them? And you yes, sir. you expect the employees to adhere to them? Yes, sir. Is there any punitive uh, action taken when they don't? Is there in the rules of conduct, is it spelled out, uh, if there are violations to those rules of conduct, uh, what the uh, repercussions are? Uh, I need to explain a little bit on it, Mr. Martinez. Uh, the rules of conduct do not have a table of penalties, if you want to call it a table of penalties. There's no such table of penalties in existence, as far as I know, in the federal government. But each rule of conduct, every employee of the Internal Revenue Service is required to report any violation of the rule of conduct by anybody in the service. Well, yeah. we, we've had instances of that where it's resulted in the, uh, in the person that was being reported on being in a position higher than the person reporting, and as a result, the person reporting suffered for it. I mean, we've had several witnesses testify to that. And, yes, I, and I'm not asking that. What I'm asking is that, you know, and let me frame it before I ask it again. You know, if you tell somebody, this is what you're expected to adhere to, this, this standard of conduct. But you don't say to them, and if you violate that this, there's the loss of your job or the loss of time or the loss, and they don't know what to expect if they do violate it, I can see that where there are some people. Now, understand this. I understand it's human nature to, for some people to get away with what they can. Other people you don't have to set any rule of conduct for. Uh, they mm -hmm. have set it for themselves, and they're going to adhere to it. And, and that's the problem in this whole thing, that you know, we keep uh, ho-hoing this and saying, well, it's not indicative of the entire department, and it probably isn't. The problem is, is that the whole department should be above reports because of the responsibility they have. And if that's the case, then, the few arrogant corrupt can't hide behind the many hardworking, ethical, professional people that are there because they taint all of them and they taint the whole department. And so what I'm asking is, has there been any, any concern? Maybe I should ask this of Mr. Goldberg. You've got a rules of conduct, rules, standards of conduct. Uh, do you intend in any way to make sure that the employees understand that if they violate any of those, there will be serious repercussions? Uh, uh, Mr. Martinez, first let me agree across the board with every sentiment you've expressed. I believe that the sentiment you are voicing about the standards we should be held to is shared by every individual at this table. With respect to the question of, I have, I have two notes here, employee investment policies, what kind of standards, if any, do we need to promulgate? And secondly, sanctions for violation of co code of conduct and other types of misconduct. It is clearly something we need to pay attention to. Our employees have to believe that we will deal firmly and swiftly with acts of misconduct. One of the questions that I think has been raised by this committee is whether we are doing so. And we need to answer that question. And if the answer is no, we need post haste to change what we're doing. Well, I really uh, hope I guess is the only word I can find, that in the new administration of the department, that you will seriously look at making sure the employees understand when there's violations, and also protections for the people that uh, are reporting the wrongdoing, because we haven't seen evidence of that in the cases we've heard, where there, those people were afforded any protection, or even, and we've, we've seen quite the contrary, um, an attitude which, you know, is is if not pervasive through the whole agency, at least pervasive in certain instances in certain areas. 
where it's uh, likened to a, uh, a good old boy syndrome where uh, if you're warm and comfortable, keep your mouth shut attitude. And you, you really can't afford that in that agency with the responsibilities that it has. And so I hope that in, in the serious effort to eliminate that that does exist, and I don't care how many times people refer to it being unique to Los Angeles, unique to Atlanta, unique to here, pretty soon that uniqueness isn't unique anymore. It's wholesale. And it seems to me that there's enough evidence already laid out before these hearings that there should be some real serious consideration into making sure that we take a new broom and sweep the house clean. Would you care to respond to that? Mr. Martinez, as I, as I said in my opening statement, as I said at my confirmation hearing, privates know a lot more about fighting the wars than the generals. I will not tolerate harassment of whistleblowers. I feel that very strongly. I believe and I trust that overwhelmingly the Internal Revenue Service employees from the GS-1 or 2 to the Senior Executive Service share that view. However, it is clear that there may well be, indeed from based on what we've heard, there, there, there are pockets of our organization where employees are afraid to come forward. We must deal with that, and we will deal with that. I, I think that what we have to do is w distill the lessons of the investigation, distill the lessons of these hearings, and set about systematically and quickly dealing with these concerns. If it's a bad apple problem, get rid of the bad apple. If it's a problem in the manuals and the guidelines, change them. If it is a structural problem that requires reorganization of how we do some of, our, some of our business, make the changes and get about the business. As I said before, I, I don't think it behooves us to dwell forever on the details, not because they're not important, but because we have already seen enough to know, and all of us have seen enough to know, that we have a big task ahead of us. And rather than take the next six months to to, to, to dot the I's and cross the T's, we know. You're right. We understand. And I think all of us understand that we have a big challenge ahead of us and we've got to get about it. And we hope that we can work with this committee, the members, with the committee staff, with the general accounting office, as we go down this road to keep you appraised of the steps we're taking, keep you apprised of the issues we are considering, the hard management choices that we need to deal with, but these words don't cut it. We've got to roll up our sleeves and get about the business. And I look forward to working with you and with your colleagues as we go down the road. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm very encouraged by that. Let, let me just ask one last question, because there have been certain names that have come up in these hearings. And so far, they're just allegations because uh, nothing has really been proven. But I think that it behooves uh, you, Mr. Commissioner, to look into some of these allegations and, and make a conscientious effort to find out where the allegations prove to be true and where those individuals have to be uh, reprimanded in some way. Do you intend to do that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Colton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gibbs, I'm delighted to see you again. Uh, it's good working with you. Uh, many times you've been before our committee. You always did an outstanding job, and uh, I, for one, am most appreciative. Mr. Gibbs, um, did you, in fact, have any knowledge that these were going, these cases uh, of Mr. Sarano's problems and some of his colleagues, that this was actually going on within your department in California? The, Rumor or otherwise? The first time that there were any allegations with respect to Mr. Sarano and the Los Angeles district that I was aware of uh, was when uh, the Forbes magazine article was published in November of, I believe, 1987. Um, and in connection with that, my recollection is that that is, is the initial time that I was aware that there were allegations of any type for, with respect to the Los Angeles Criminal Investigation Division. Were you aware of the threats to some of the, your IRS employees by their superiors that we heard yesterday? There was an anonymous letter, unsigned, that came in 
um, and I think it came in in February of 1988 uh, that were uh, where there were allegations on the part of whoever wrote the letter that there were actions uh, being taken that were inappropriate in the Los Angeles Criminal Investigation Division. Did you make any attempt to correct this uh, at that point in time? Well, it was, let me go back and remind you, it was an anonymous letter. It expressed a reason that it was anonymous was fear of reprisal. By the same token, we had a number of external influences in connection with cases, yes. and I really was not sure whether the letter was from someone within the Internal Revenue Service or not. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, my recollection is that we referred that matter to the inspection division in the national office for review, if I recall correctly. Were you also familiar with the abuse of travel by Lagoon? Was that brought to your attention? I do not recall any discussion of that uh, until uh, during the course of this investigation. Uh, it came out that there were allegations with respect to uh, Mr. Langone's travel vouchers. Mr. Gibbs, one last question. I have to go vote now. Um, you, you claim opposition to uh, the transfer of the uh, inspection function to that of Inspector General of the Treasury Department, yet all the people we've talked to uh, have shown proof that this system does work. Don't you think it warrants an attempt to try to do this, at least on a temporary basis, to see if it does work? I expressed my opposition based on the concerns that I outlined in my testimony and in my opening statement. Um, I have been asked and I tried to respond to the question that I think is a legitimate question. What's different about the Internal Revenue Service from the other agencies of the federal government where the Inspector General has been used? And I tried to explain that I thought there were two basic differences. One was that I think the Internal Revenue Service is unique in terms of the number of American citizens that deal with the agency and deal with very confidential personal and financial information. And that I thought the second reason that it was unique was that there are instances in our history, twice, the Truman scandals and the Nixon-Watergate scandal, where there have been attempts by political appointees and politicians to improperly use the Internal Revenue Service and access to the Internal Revenue Service records and so forth to attempt to interfere with taxpayer cases. And that while I certainly understand that that is an alternative to what we're presently doing, my own opinion, based on the 17 years that I've been in and out of government and the 26 years that I've been practicing as an attorney, is that given the choices, I think we would be better off trying to have a career non-political uh, inspection organization and deal realistically with the issues that this inspection and this hearing raises. That's, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. I would like just for the record, uh, and we don't, I think we have really discussed this situation probably sufficiently. We have not reached any conclusion, but this has to do with the uh, Jordache case. But for the record, I'd like to, uh, Mr. Kern, in Paul Marciano's deposition, deposition in a civil case, in a civil case, he stated that at a meeting at his home with Sarnoff and Mr. Connett, the Jordache gasoline matter was discussed. We have this in a, dis a deposition. Connett was only at one meeting at a Marciano home. The one that produced the two large boxes of Marciano supplied documents on Jordache, Connett told us that these two boxes were given to Sarnoff and Connett at Paul Mar Marciano's home and that they contained private investigator photos, reports, analysis, and so forth. Mr. Connett was never at a meeting when the Bobot case was discussed, which leads me to believe that Mr. Connett is in error in trying to indicate that we already have the information that he's alluding to. We do not have that information. Uh, it's, it's not clear. We'd be happy to work with the committee on trying to resolve that issue. I think it's resolvable 
not to alleviate the problem we talked about earlier, I think there is some confusion. We'd be more than happy to set that straight. Well, it, it'll be interesting to see what IRS does in this particular case. Yes, sir, but you have also referred it to the Justice Department. That's and right. I'm sure and watching between, them too. between the two of them, we will work that out as what well, records are we talking well, about? Let's hope, let's hope so, yeah. because we've been discouraged to even talk with That's the Public correct. Integrity yeah. Division. You know, we, we yeah. are, you know, we're beyond that jurisdiction. Um, Mr. Gibbs, on page 10 of your statement, you state that disclosure attorneys attended interviews for the purpose of advising the IRS employees during the interview when disclosure questions arose. IRS attorneys were instructed neither to take notes nor to report to other any, to, 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 nor to report to other any statement made by IRS employees in response to the investigator's questions. Am I correct? That's yes, on sir. page that 10? Yes, that's on page 10 of my statement. Well, I would like to I'd like to refer the panel to a, com to a document. Uh, dated June 13, 1989. It was to the Associate Chief Counsel litigation. Who would that be? Yes, sir. Furnished to us by IRS. I mean, no. Who? Another source. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No. Okay. Well, you go ahead and read it. I'm going to read it in the meantime. Uh, in this particular document uh, that was from Mr. Louis Coluso, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, Good. and Mr. Joseph Urban, and a copy of that, no, excuse me, yeah, and a co I thought a copy of that went to the uh, commissioner's office, the deputy commissioner's Okay. But anyway, this document says this. We are writing to provide you with any information as an allegation of impropriety concerning Mary Ann Curtin of the Disclosure Litigation Division. This memorandum confirms our June 9, 1989 conversation on this matter. On June 8, 1989, we attended an interview of service employee Paul Whitmore, which was conducted by Congressman Bernard's Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs. Four subcommittee investigators were present. The interview was ostensibly to obtain information on Mr. Whitmore's knowledge of IRS procedures and policies. However, it became really, however, it became readily apparent that the real purpose of the interview was to discuss the propriety of advice provided by Ms. Curtin to IRS Special Agent Duncan prior to Mr. Duncan's February 1988 interview by the House Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Crime. According to Whitmore, I could go on and on. A third, well, I'm going to go ahead and read it. According to Whitmore, a third-party source told Duncan, uh, so forth and so on, and I, I, I will not talk about that particular, was involved in criminal misconduct. Duncan viewed this as information which he wanted to provide to the Judiciary Committee. Ms. Curtin did not agree with this characterization since Duncan had no hard evidence. Ms. Curtin told Duncan that if the Judiciary, Judiciary Subcommittee asked Duncan if he had information on so-and-so and so-and-so, uh, Duncan would re reply that he did not. Whitmore and Duncan were not comfortable with this advice, and the matter was brought to the attention of Ms. Curtin's supervisor, Mr. Philpy. Mr. Philpy resolved the disagreement to everyone's satisfaction, according to this paper. Throughout the interview, the, Depart the Bernard investigators pursued this matter as if Ms. Curtin directed Duncan to lie to Congress. Mr. Whitmore never stated this to be the case, but in answering questions, he appeared on numerous occasions to adopt that premise. For example, when asked by Ms. Curtin would, uh, why Ms. Curtin would tell Duncan to lie, Whitmore respons responded that he did not know, although he speculated it might have something to do with the problems that so-and-so was having politically in Washington at the time. Then in the last paragraph, in our opinion, the Bernard investigators did little to develop all the facts around the Cur Curtin-Duncan disagreement. Uh, first of all, Mr. Gibbs, would you think that that was in accordance with the instructions that the uh, uh, attorneys were supposed to do? To Mr. Chairman, I do not have the benefit of the facts with respect to that matter. That matter has arisen, uh, quite honestly, since I left. But my understanding is 
that the issue relates directly to a disagreement between what um, the attorney says uh, that was the advice that was given and what the uh, criminal investigators indicate was the advice that was given. So that it's the only, it is literally the only case I know of where you have an allegation being made directly against an attorney for the Internal Revenue Service. Maybe there are other instances in your investigation where that has taken place. This is the only one I'm aware of. And it goes to what happened with respect to uh, advice that the attorney did or did not give in connection with an interview. Uh, and my reaction is, I don't know, I haven't thought that through, but it seems to me that's somewhat different. Well, it just appears to me that this is in complete contradiction. Mr. Bernard, let me clarify it, because I have, do have access to all the facts on that issue. Um, let me say that uh, earlier today I sat and listened to the testimony of Mr. Duncan and Mr. Uh, uh, Whitmore. Uh, I thought it was uh, a one-sided presentation. Let me s and, and also like to point out that uh, the, the subcommittee staff uh, did not ask to interview our attorneys, four of whom we made available on Monday of this week. Did not uh, ask Did, did not ask to interview our, the, the witnesses to this incident until late last week. We made them available on Monday. They interviewed four people on Monday, all of whom contradicted the testimony of Duncan and Whitmore. The written statement prepared was not modified to f reflect that conflict. A passing oral statement was made that there's a conflict here. We have four attorneys who categorically deny we have contemporaneous records that were maintained during the course of the investigation, during the course of our providing advice to Mr. Duncan and Mr. Whitmore. Documents were prepared at that time which will contradict them. So this staff has not asked for those documents and has chosen not to look into this matter in an effective way. I'm very pleased you had a chance to ask this question because I think it was unfair for you to allow those two individuals to get up and to essentially make statements about an uh, an individual who's a first-rate attorney who works for me without any effort to, to provide a balanced picture for it or any kind of rebuttal. This memorandum was provided to me in connection with this investigation because of my role as a supervisory attorney for, those, for, for the attorneys in that group. I did have access to other information in the course of the investigation and as we were making disclosure decisions. Mr. Kelly, do you, are you telling me then that this is the only incident where counsel did not report, report back to you or Mr. Murphy Let me as to what the questions were and what the replies were? My, the indication I'm saying is I was a supervisor for those attorneys for providing them with disclosure advice and making decisions that they were making when handling these 90-some witnesses and 30,000 pages. They reported to me and I told them how to deal with the various problems that would arise. It was not reported back to management for purposes of chilling any witnesses. W were you familiar with Mr. Uh, Gibbs' assurance to us? Uh, yes, I was assured and that I felt this was consistent, that I had to supervise the attorneys and I had to know what was going on, so it was consistent. This, as well, I say, why was wasn't there communication with our committee that there would be uh, uh, reporting back and, and follow up? The, there is not reporting back in the sense of it going back to management for purposes of chilling. Aren't or, you in management? I am a, an attorney. I, I, that's what I Aren't do for a living. Aren't you responsible to the management? I, I, I did not report on to management the information that, was, that I obtained. In other words, you, uh, you kept confidential Correct. the information. This ain't confidential. Certainly it's not confidential. You just had a hearing where you they told the whole world about it. Well, they didn't tell it. They told it before. It, they, they have told the story before now. Well, I find it difficult to understand why you have one memorandum directed to me and no one has asked for the entire file a voluminous file which would describe the entire background of this incident. I really think you, Mr. Bernard, are a fair individual. And I think if you had had an opportunity to listen to our witnesses and to look at the file that we had could make available and are willing to make available, you would have had serious questions about whether that panel would have been presented All right. this morning. Staff tells me that they interviewed the uh, disclosure attorneys for five hours on Monday and on they could have brought the file with them. They've never been reluctant to ask for the file yet. Uh, suddenly they're uh, well, standing thought, on ceremony. We thought we, that y'all were in the habit of bringing it after what, the, so many well, long period of time. The point was that you had four attorneys, all of whom testified and denied the allegations by Mr. Duncan and Mr. Whitmore. Okay? What was done with that information was a passing uh, 
allusion to this was made while the written statement l was left unchanged. What's well, going to be your a recommendation to the commissioner about this case? About which? About the case? Ms. Curtin's t case. Uh, is it going to be an, in, uh, an investigation at all? We have asked that the inspection, Treasury inspection people come in and look at that. We've made the file available to them. We feel our advice was perfectly appropriate, and we think anybody who wants to look at it can look at it, and you'll find that it's perfectly appropriate. I would suggest the committee look at it more closely because, as I say, I think it was really an unfair presentation to allow those people to testify this morning without any response from the service. And uh, when you're dealing well, you with the reputation of a you fine respond, attorney. You can respond now. I am responding now. We categorically deny what went on. And we also responded with four witnesses on Monday. Uh, all, of the people, uh, all of the people that you are testifying for, did you put them under oath? Well, I didn't put them under oath, but they're willing to be under Were they under oath when they testified before your committee? Yes, they were under oath. Well, we will, um, we will, I, I want to take that back up. I think we need to. Uh, I've, um, I've invited Mr. Alexander to, uh, who's not a member of the committee, but a former member of the committee, uh, to uh, uh, come before the, uh, to, to sit in at these hearings. And according to the accommodations that we have in Congress, I'd, I'd give him the opportunity to uh, ask any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Chairman Bernard and the entire committee uh, for permitting these uh, hearings. And I would uh, explain my reason for being here uh, to uh, state for the record, and under oath if you wish, Mr. Chairman, uh, that the ha House Appropriations Committee specifically the Subcommittee on State Justice, Commerce, and the Judiciary and Treasury, both of which I am a member, together and in cooperation with the Subcommittee on Crime, uh, Chairman Hughes of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, the General Accounting Office, and in cooperation with the Arkansas State Police, the Criminal Investigation Division, I have been investigating events surrounding the MENA Arkansas Airport for several years. The allegations there are of the most serious nature involving allegations of high crimes in high places in Washington. They involve allegations that a C-123, C-130 operation, contract operation, uh, was operating out of MENA Airport, transporting guns to Central America and returning drugs to Arkansas and laundering money in Arkansas from the sale of those drugs. I wish at this point to state publicly my appreciation for the cooperation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Drug Enforcement Administration, both of which agencies have cooperated with the House Appropriations Committee, the General Accounting Office, Subcommittee on Crime, and the Arkansas State Police. This investigation led us to the Internal Revenue Service about a year ago, at which time I attempted to obtain the cooperation of the Internal Revenue Service by providing uh, access to uh, one of the witnesses here today, Mr. Duncan. The uh, I believe it was uh, in September of last year, because of the failure of that cooperation, I wrote a letter to Mr. Gibbs, who was then commissioner, and I will submit a copy of that letter for the record, requesting the cooperation of the commission and specifically requesting uh, the access to information and testimony of Mr. Duncan. Uh, I did not receive a reply to that letter. Uh, by March of this year, uh, and I uh, spoke directly to Mr. Murphy, who appeared before our Committee on Treasury Appropriations, and Mr. Murphy appeared to be cooperative and stated his cooperation, but as of this moment, except for the evidence that I've heard here today and through the General Accounting Office resulting from the resignation of Mr. Duncan as a criminal investigator for the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS has not provided any evidence or any access to that evidence to me 
to the Subcommittee on Crime, nor to the General Accounting Office or the Arkansas State Police uh, Criminal Investigation Division. I will state for the record that it has only been through the resignation of Mr. Duncan and his testimony here today uh, that we have discovered part of the truth uh, that we think will lead us to an indictment on money laundering charges uh, uh, for drug trafficking in Arkansas. Uh, the action uh, of the Internal Revenue Service uh, has prevented the government from investigating and prosecuting these cases in Arkansas. Now, I don't think that it is intentional on your part to do so, but I would like to state to you that I have for over a year been trying to gain access to Mr. Duncan's testimony. Uh, it has been explained to me that uh, he that you could not provide it because of it was it was uh, prevented by the security uh, provisions of the confidentiality requirements on tax uh, uh, returns and uh, grand jury uh, uh, information. I might say that the emissary that you have uh, sent to me has been most polite uh, in, uh, in explaining that to me. The effect of the failure of your cooperation has been to permit the statute of limitation to continue to run on persons that we believe to be drug traffickers, in effect to protect those drug traffickers and their drug lords that are profiting from the illicit drug trafficking in the United States and specifically in my state of Arkansas. That is to say that little children in Arkansas are buying drugs because we are unable to discover sufficient evidence to bring indictments to prevent that from happening. Now, I don't think you intend to do that, but that's the effect of the government and the bureaucracy not cooperating with law enforcement officials. Uh, it is a serious problem in this country and one of the most serious obstacles to attacking the problem, the war on drugs, is the bureaucracy. Are uh, the rules and regulations and the in intentional prevention of the submission of evidence that we have heard from the witnesses today. Now, I'd just like to ask a couple of questions about those witnesses because my committee, together with the Subcommittee on Crime and in cooperation with this committee, will be subpoenaing you gentlemen in the future if that is necessary to, to get all the, the information. And uh, we hope that is not necessary. Uh, Mr. Murphy, did you know that uh, my effort uh, since I talked with you in March to acquire access to needed information uh, to pursue a prosecution in Arkansas has not been forthcoming? Mr. Alexander, I am aware that there's been serious issues as to whether, <clears throat> uh, what information, if any, we could provide to you. As you well pointed out, on the day that I testified before the House Appropriations Committee, we met, and I thought we had a, a good communication privately. We, we have a good communication. And we can stipulate that. Okay. And we don't uh, have any evidence. Okay, all right. I understand that. <laughs> the letter that you referred to, I thought that you showed me was a letter that you wrote to the regional commissioner in Southeast. And I also recall that I apologized to you for, for not responding to it. I had Mr. Ms. Murphy, Warren, you are yeah. correct. The letter was to the regional oh. commissioner in Atlanta. I am mistaken about that. I will submit a copy of the letter for the record. Okay, and I, and I, uh, I the apology for being non-responsive to the letter is something that mm -hmm. uh, whether you wrote to the regional commissioner or to me or to the commissioner, uh, we should be responding to you. Now it's been I a had, year. It's been a year, Mr. Murphy. <laughs> I know that, Mr. Alexander. I also would like to just that's point out that's limitation is running on the criminals. I understand that too, Mr. Alexander, but I had Ms. Morin with me. I told you that I would hope that, that we could find w some way. I'm going to ask Mr. Cately to respond to the question because there were issues that upon the advice of counsel that I gave directions that if there was some way that we could legally cooperate with your committee and provide information to you, that was my Mr. objective. Mr. Murphy, That's I really understand awesome. that you have rules and regulations to operate by, and we don't want to violate those rules. It is not our purpose to do that. 
Our purpose is to try to stop drugs from coming into this country. Your interpretation of your rules and regulation are in effect cooperating with the drug lords. Mr. Your Allen. bureaucracy is preventing us from waging a war on drugs. Mr. Alexander, before I ask Mr. Cately to respond, I would like to just point out to you, and I think you're aware, agents along with Special Agent Duncan, when he was with us, across the country have been partners in dealing with the war on drugs. We've gotten much, much recognition on that, and I think we can even do more on it, and we are supportive Mr. of that. But Mr. I think Mr. Cately can respond uh, to these Mr. specifics. Murphy, Mr. Cately can respond for the record. I've heard the explanation. The basic problem here is that we are not able, that we, the United States Congress, I don't know about these gentlemen, I have the highest possible clearance that the government can provide for secrecy. I am cleared for secrets uh, that the president gets and no one else. Now, I am cleared for the highest possible information clearance that you can have, but I have been denied access to information in a criminal investigation in my state. Now, Mr. Duncan came in here this morning and he has testified uh, that he was prevented from offering evidence that he thought relevant to that investigation. In effect, he has been, he has testified that he was in effect ordered to perjure himself in evidence before a grand jury. I have other uh, information that Mr. Duncan believes that the, the prevention of his testimony before the grand jury prevented an indictment for, on drug laundering charges. Very serious charges, and you are all part of that. What we want to do is to get to the bottom of this thing so that we are all working together to fight this war on drugs instead of fighting one another. We're fighting one another. We ought to be out here fighting these drug lords. Now, will you and Mr. Goldberg order all of the agents in the Internal Revenue Service to cooperate with these investigations? And will you submit a memorandum to that effect and send us a copy of it? Mr. Alexander, I will make crystal clear every one of our employees that they are they are obligated to and they will cooperate to the fullest extent of the law with your investigation and any other investigation conducted by the Congress of the United States and will you put in writing uh, to me the reason that you have not cooperated thus far mr. Alexander uh, I haven't stopped beating my wife I, I don't know whether we've cooperated or not but I assure you I will personally look into this matter and I will be personally on your doorstep in the very near future with my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Gibbs, let me ask you a question. Uh, during 1988 and 1989, did you or anyone from Treasury uh, ever go to the tax writing committees to discuss this subcommittee's investigation? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, I not only went to the uh, tax writing subcommittees, I also talked to Mr. Craig, uh, who was then the minority uh, leader on the, on the committee, the uh, ranking minority person on the committee. Um, I also talked to Ron Perlman, who is the chief of staff of the Joint Taxation Committee. I talked to uh, Mr. Jim Gould, who was the uh, Chief of Staff of Senator Benson's Senate Finance Committee. And the subject also came up in discussion with uh, Mr. Bill Archer, uh, Congressman Archer, who is the uh, ranking minority member uh, on the um, Ways and Means Committee. Can you tell us what you discussed? I brought to their attention the fact that this committee was performing an investigation of the Internal Revenue Service and that there was a resolution pending or would be pending on the floor of the House 
to permit access to documents under Section 6103. I explained to them, as I explained to you, Mr. Chairman, that it was my understanding that that resolution would permit Internal Revenue Service to turn over documents to the committee, but would not permit the Internal Revenue Service to testify in an open hearing with respect to information that had been provided. I told them that I had no recommendation, but simply urged so that as the investigation developed, we would not find ourselves uh, partly in the tax writing committees, partly in this committee and so forth, to see if something could be worked out so that two things. One, disclosure could be made with respect to the investigation of the records. And secondly, so that we would have an opportunity as an organization to make a complete public statement of whatever response we care to make. Well, Mr. Gibbs, your previous experience with this committee, what makes you think that we would not have given IRS that opportunity if we had gotten the waiver? My understanding of the law, sir, is that it is not a question of whether you could or, or would. It's a question of whether you could. My understanding is that you can accept the tax return information in executive committee, but that it cannot be, from the standpoint of our response to it, we cannot just respond in open committee. Did you, did you by any chance suggest that they do the investigation rather than this committee? No, sir. I was asked on several occasions, did I have a recommendation? I said I did not want to get between this committee and the tax writing committees. Did and then what I would appreciate it, I said that I would really appreciate it so that I didn't get into a jurisdictional issue if they would instead have conversations with this committee. Do you I understood those conversations took place. Well, I, I would say, what kind of conversations took place? My understanding, and this again comes from your staff to my staff, was that there were conversations between the tax writing committees and this committee, and that you simply could not work out an arrangement that would permit them and you to work cooperatively on some basis where the, the information could be disclosed. Well, I must say, and while I have the greatest, greatest respect for Mr. Rostenkowski uh, and Mr. Benson, who is chairman of the committee, uh, not much of a discussion took place. The answer was just no. And I uh, am sort of suspicious that they were fortified by your discussion with them um, in this matter, and that's why we, don't, we, don't, we did not get the waiver. I told Mr. Craig everything that I mentioned to them in terms of what my concerns were and so forth. I asked for no special treatment other than the opportunity to completely respond in an open forum and to the public with, with whatever came out. Do you, ever, do you ever recall discussing that with me? Uh, I, I recall discussing with you the first time we met what my concern was about a floor resolution in terms of, I, I had asked you, you responded to me when I asked the question of whether this had been discussed. You told me, yes, that you had reason to believe this would be forthcoming. And therefore, I assumed well, that we, this had already been discussed with the tax writing committees. Well, and not to this, not to, I would say that it had been probably uh, uh, discussed very summarily, but it hadn't been discussed to the nth degree. But nevertheless, you know, I think that uh, in spite of that, uh, I want to say I think that we've done a pretty good job in looking into the uh, allegations without that information. Uh, I do take, uh, I, I naturally, uh, as a member of Congress, someone like all the other members of this committee uh, who have access to very important information, uh, I feel like 6103 uh, uh, is a very good bill. I have no problems with the fact that it would be a wrong to disclose taxpayers' information to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, I do say, though, that we're all a very, hopefully, a legitimate members of this Congress. We do have an official legal oversight responsibility as much as any other committee of Congress, the Tax Writing Committee or the uh, Joint Committee on Taxation. Uh, but at the same time, we did not uh, get the information. Mr. Chairman, could I, could I comment on that? Sure. I have no problem with what you're saying. I really don't. All I, what I have said in the context of this, and I believe this was reported back to your staff, the only thing that I was urging was that however the investigation be conducted, we get to the point 
where we could make a full disclosure and have an opportunity to publicly respond with respect to whatever came out of the investigation. That's the only place that's where I've been coming from as commissioner. Mr. Gibbs, over the last year, we've heard many rumors um, that I'd like to give you this opportunity to put to rest. In 1987, did you or anyone from Treasury contact the Forbes magazine to discuss the publication uh, of an article on the IRS? I was contacted, if I recall correctly, by the Forbes folks on several occasions. I did not contact them. I did not take any action at all to out affect the publication of any articles in Forbes magazine at all. What about the Treasury? I have no knowledge with respect to the, what, the, what the Treasury did. Mr. Chairman, I would like to just add to that question by, by telling you the minute I found out about that allegation, without discussion with Mr. Gibbs, I referred that matter for investigation to the Treasury Inspector General. So you do not know whether the Treasury Inspector General contacted Forbes magazine or not? Well, I do not know that. I do know that they, they did clear the commissioner of any wrongdoing on that matter, but I do not know whether any contact was made with uh, Forbes. Um, our investigation findings suggest that drinking is a large part of the CID culture. Uh, you know, you've got to be pretty hep to do this undercover work drive hot boats and hot cars and drink a lot of liquor. In addition to the cases that we investigated, we've heard of numerous instances where CID agents were drinking on duty and this drinking affected their performance. Uh, Mr. Goldberg, do you see the need for better policing of existing rules and regulations regarding drinking on duty? I'd like uh, Mr. Bil Milburn to respond to that question in detail. As I understand that it is a with certain limited exceptions dealing with undercover work, a flagrant violation of our rules to drink while on duty. And if we are not policing those rules adequately, we should, we should start and we should start today. Through the committee's um, investigation, we have seen several instances, if true, that uh, do need to be taken care of from a disciplinary standpoint. Our guidelines are pretty strict. There is no drinking on duty, except the special agent needs to drink to protect an identity. Now. When we train our undercover agents, they're trained from day one. If you can avoid using alcohol at all, avoid it. Uh, we have strict prohibitions on drug usage. There is to be no drug usage whatsoever. We help them fabricate um, backgrounds uh, to get away from that, that type of thing. But as I mentioned, this is an area we need to look into, and there are several situations that have come up. Do you plan to look into the situation of Mr. Xanthos and Mr. Lipkin? In conjunction with the uh, regional office uh, in Western Region, yes, I think at the appropriate time, that's, we, we should take a look at that. Mr. Yep. You have a question? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I think if I were to ask questions, they'd be redundant now with everything that's been asked. Uh, so I'll refrain from doing that. would like to make a couple brief, very brief observations. First, Mr. Goldberg, welcome to the job. Thanks, Mr. Schiff. And uh, <laughs> let, let me say, we've, we've heard this, there's, there's, what I'd just like to observe is, when, when this in investigation first started, I was a little bit skeptical in the sense that in a large organization, there are always going to be allegations of impropriety. In a large number of human beings, some of those allegations will be true. And of course, many allegations that the organization does not take action will, will come from malcontents and people who are unhappy with the organization for whatever personal reason. I want you to know that I have uh, heard the testimony, read the testimony before this committee in the last couple of days. I'm personally convinced from the large number of people we heard from who appear to be of a very high caliber personally, all saying the same thing, that from the very top of the IRS, it has grown somehow into the feeling that one should not take strong action against impropriety by senior officials, that I'm convinced that that developed in the Internal Revenue Service. I don't want to point a finger as to whom or how, but, but we heard it from enough individuals with enough credibility from enough different locations that I'm convinced it is, it is uh, a uh, situation existing in the IRS. I wonder if you've had enough time to tell me if you're convinced of the same or, or if you think the uh, if the jury is still out in your mind as to what the situation is. I'll ask that one question. 
Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Schiff, as, as, as I sort through this, it seems to me as, as it relates to our inspection function, the, the starting point is a code of conduct. We have to be held to the highest possible standards. Second, we have to be able to identify promptly when allegations of misconduct occur. Next, we have to be able to adequately and prompt, promptly and properly investigate those allegations. And finally, we need to deal with those allegations swiftly and surely if problems arise. And those are, there, there are three prongs to that effort. I believe this committee's investigation and these hearings have raised questions at all three of those levels. Clearly, some of the time we do investigate well. We, we do identify allegations of wrongdoing. Some of the time we investigate properly. Some of the time we deal with it. But, but I believe that you have clearly identified possible and potentially serious shortcomings in each of those areas. I haven't prejudged, is it, is it 8 on a 10 scale or 9 on a 10 scale? They are serious enough to command my immediate and personal attention. More importantly, they're clear enough to demand the, intent, the attention of our entire organization. Senior management has to listen very carefully to what you people are saying because we have to buy into the program that we've got to identify, we've got to investigate, and we've got to deal with these kinds of allegations. And the leadership has to come from the very top. You That's agree right. With that? Mr. Ship, it has to come from the very top. It has to be bought into by the entire organization. One, one last thing. This is uh, a little more technical in nature. I think it certainly falls under your prerogative now as commissioner. But in uh, studying your organization during this hearing and hearing from witnesses, uh, apparently regional, uh, uh, regional, inspector, regional inspectors for inspection, regional commissioners for inspection, report to regional commissioners. Um, that's what I, we were told. I believe that that is incorrect, Mr. Schiff. I, I believe that the regional inspectors report directly to, to the assistant right, commissioner. Uh, I, I thought we had testimony that they reported at the regional level rather than a vertical, uh, rather than a vertical Absol level. Absolutely not. Now, Teddy, you may want to elaborate on that. Well, sir, the, the organization and Internal Revenue Service, I personally report to the commissioner, and I'm the only assistant commissioner that does so. All regional inspectors report direct to me and to nobody else. The director of internal security, the director of internal audit, the regional inspectors do not report to them either. They, re they report, I may have been considering CID. Yeah. Um, That's right, correct. Right. Yeah. But, you're, but the inspectors report on a straight vertical line. That's correct. Exactly. Right into me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hastert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through the three days of these hearings, we've uh, been through a lot of allegations, testimony, uh, a lot of problems from our perception of things that happen. Ultimately, you know, a service as big as the IRS with as many employees and certainly dealing with everybody who virtually has a social security number which you deal, there's going to be some problems. But I think that there's good cause here to, to feel that there's some systemic problems that you can begin to approach. And I, and I think that's what the whole focus of this is, and, and certainly I would take issue, and I, as I said, a new kid on the block here, uh, you dealt with uh, my predecessor, and we didn't have the pleasure of dealing with each other, but, uh, you know, basically, I think the function of this committee is oversight, and I think when the Congress and uh, representing the people of this nation that's what we're here for. We're here to, to peel away the skin and to look underneath and to see what the problems are. And by doing that, hopefully hopefully we come up with, with at least an incentive to improve and make the system better. And, uh, you know, basically it comes down to accountability. And as an agency uh, is only accountable to itself, sometimes that system means that you know, there's a collegiality, there's a fraternity, and we can take care of things inside. Congress, we're accountable, and our accountability is every two years, whether we like it or not. And people look at us and they peel the skin away, and every vote that we ever make and every vote that we've missed, uh, you know, we get put on the griddle for it. And I guess 
and our own mean spirit, we start to hold you guys accountable. But actually, that's the way it works. If we don't hold you accountable, those people out there have no way to make sure that they have accountability in your agency or any other agency that comes under the auspices of this Government Operations Committee and Subcommittee. So I'm going to be interested to see what changes are made. And uh, I, Mr. Goldberg, will be a, an interested observer in, in your uh, tenure. And I look forward to good things. And uh, I just hope that we can stay in touch. Mr. Thank Hastert, I, I hope you are more than obser an observer. I hope you are a participant. Thank you very much. Who would agree? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Cox, I'm going to give you two minutes. I'd like to return to uh, uh, one item that uh, we raised earlier. Mr. Levy uh, wrote a memo to the file on June 15, 1989. And he explained that the reason that he destroyed documents was that he compared his original documents, that is to say those documents he originally received, uh, with those produced uh, following the execution of a search warrant, saw no discrepancies, and he was short of space. We received a, a letter from the acting assistant to the commissioner for legislative liaison explaining that the reason that the documents were destroyed was that they were not relevant to the investigation. Now, those are two different reasons, and I wonder whether you know what is the source of the difference since the fellow who destroyed the documents wrote in a memo to the file that he destroyed them since they were duplicates. <clears throat> Well, I understand. I believe the story covered both items, but uh, I think it was just we asked him to draft a memo explaining the location of the documents quickly, saying we had this request from the Hill and we would like some explanation of where they were, and the document was drafted and kind of faxed in quickly to explain it. Uh, I think it is an inadvertent uh, uh, omission, and I think the story as I understood it was that it was a combination of those aspects. But again, that's one of the factual issues which I think uh, some inquiry here could, uh, could develop. I'd, I'd like to just say in conclusion that I think that the most important testimony given here today was Commissioner Goldberg's statement that he believes that the image of the Internal Revenue Service is enhanced, not tarnished, and the public knows that the IRS itself aggressively investigates and punishes all wrongdoing by IRS employees. And I'm in total agreement with that. I think every member of this committee is certainly the chairman. Uh, I think that this exercise will serve to enhance the image of the Internal Revenue Service, uh, which is, of course, in the interest of all of us. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. Thank you. Mr. Goldberg, can you tell us about the conduct of IRS special agents in the Omni case? These agents were accused, I believe, of backdating documents and manufacturing documents. The uh, question is, was an IRS inspection or Treasury IG investigation conducted of these individuals? And were these individuals administer, uh, administratively uh, punished? And thirdly, are these individuals still employed by IRS? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have, I have no knowledge of that matter. I'd like Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that was investigated by a grand jury, and I'd like to submit for the record the Baltimore uh, Sun article of February 24, 1989, IRS agents, prosecutors cleared of a wrongdoing. The, what, uh, would you repeat that? The, they were cleared of any wrongdoing through a federal grand jury inquiry. Well, that satisfies that. Um, <coughs> well, Mr. Melvin, one, one question for the record. Thank you. This yes, sir. Uh, can you tell the subcommittee whether the IRS special agents are authorized to destroy documents in the type of situation Mr. Levy was in? I think you responded to that earlier. Yes. In other words, what are the specific circumstances that would allow a special agent to destroy documents in an, in an ongoing sensitive case without preparing an inventory of the documents destroyed? First of all, we're in the, the business of gathering evidence. Uh, we're not in the habit of destroying documents along the way. But in that process, you'll make photocopies of original documents to make notes on or to make tick marks on as you're going through long lists and things like that to make sure you have everything or whatever you're doing. Those type of documents are not the best evidence 
and if not needed for the case, may be destroyed. Because we can generate miles and miles of paper in the work we do. Under those circumstances, they could be, and that's where you get into what I was referring to earlier, this non-record area. It, it's, it gets down to what's the best evidence in some of these cases. Well, let me uh, summarize at this point and see that everybody has uh, <laughs> uh, jumped ship, if you might want to call that. I don't know what kind of retribution they think y'all going to do to them, but they've all gone. But uh, I said on three occasions, three occasions, and it's because of my association as chairman of this committee over the last six years, except going nearly seven years, my association with members in the IRS, my good relationship with Mr. Gibbs, Mr. Murphy, and I hope to be Mr. Goldberg, and I'm sure it will be. I want to emphasize these points, and that is that it is our belief that the overwhelming majority of all IRS employees are hardworking, conscientious, and honest. And the second is that our expectation that these hearings will be a positive force within the IRS for reform of employee integrity, policies, practice, procedures, and organizational structure. But I've got to editorial just a little bit, Mother, by saying this. We have had some serious allegations of misconduct from all over the country that have been brought to the subcommittee's attention over the last year. These cases go beyond the eight that the subcommittee has investigated in detail over the last year. Actually, there have been some serious cases of misconduct and inappropriate behavior by senior management that has been brought to light over the last two days of hearings. Yesterday, Mr. Haybacker alone, serious cases of misconduct and inappropriate behavior by senior management that has been brought to light over the last two days of hearings. Yesterday, Mr. Haybacker alone, a former division chief in San Francisco, testified under oath to five very disturbing instances of misconduct of senior levels in various offices in the western region. Mr. Shirai detailed a situation in Los Angeles where management suggested witnesses in an internal investigation color testimony on an investigation of a favored employee. We have a list of cases from Buffalo, Atlanta, Baltimore, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Newark, Louisville, and, and the National Office. These allegations are not frivolous. I personally received a letter from a former Attorney General of the United States on one case. An assistant U.S. attorney contacted the subcommittee on another case. And just yesterday, one of your current CID chiefs called the subcommittee to report wrongdoing. I wonder why he called us and not inspection. I'm just saying that in Mr. Gibbs' statement on page 3, and in your testimony throughout, Mr. Murphy, the impression is that our investigation is focusing on isolated cases. I cannot in my wildest imagination believe that you think that this committee, these inspectors, have not done a good conscientious job without having a lot of help from within the IRS. So I say that, that we feel like that, that this has been a very legitimate, conscientious uh, uh, investigation. And we will be looking with much interest as to how the IRS, Mr. Goldberg, under your leadership, uh, responds to some of these problems uh, in the area of um, integrity. And with that, I want to thank all of you for being here. I thank you for the patience that you've taken over these two days and certainly the contribution that you have made to this, uh, to this uh, investigation and this hearing. And I want to wish you, Mr. Gibbs, the best in all of your future. You're a great fella, and we wish you the best. And we will uh, certainly wish you, Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Murphy, uh, success in your activities as well. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This hearing of the House Government Operations Subcommittee will re-air this weekend on C-SPAN. 
Join us Sunday morning at 2.10 a.m. Eastern Time. That's 11.10 in the evening for our viewers on the West Coast. Coming up next, we'll break for a look at the rest of the overnight schedule, then follow with Thursday's Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on the nomination of William Lucas to be Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights.